All right, gentlemen, I have with me Mr. James J. Sexton. You guys are going to love this one. We are live from Lake Tahoe, California, and finally the audio is working, so, so here we go. I only have one clip. We only need one clip for this show. Only one. And I apologize. It's one from last week. For better. For better. For worse. For worse. For richer. For richer. For poor. For poorer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we hit Destinag about 20 times in counseling. Brill made it very clear to Jonathan, you cannot be broke. In sickness, in sickness, and in health, and in health, to love, to love, cherish, cherish, and to obey. <laughs> we didn't talk about that one in council. We did talk about that in council. <laughs> yes, we did. So you want me to repeat that again? You want to just keep going? I think we can keep going. All right. <laughs> All right. I have James Sexton. It's been a long time coming, my friend. That's on my bucket list. I, yeah. I have been, I've been a huge fan for a lot of years. And uh, I got to tell you, man, back in 2013, when the Rational Mail came out, I was already working as a divorce lawyer. And I read it and I was like, oh, preach. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm really, I, it's been a crazy couple of weeks. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm really gratified by how, the, you know, the video blew up on Software Underbelly. But uh, yeah. the first, this is the first live appearance I've done. First question and answer. There was only mm. one place I was going to do it and only one person I was going to do it with. And that was you. So <laughs> I'm psyched to be here. Man. I'm totally, I, me too, man. Because like you hit me up and you were, um, you said, hey, man, I, I got in touch with you about like two or three years ago. And I'm yeah. like, I'm, I felt so bad. I'm like, oh, did I just, <laughs> did I not get the email? Did I not respond to this guy or whatever? And it might have been, um, it might have been in the Rule Zero days when I think, um, like Rich Cooper was probably he was he was like my my go to guy when it came to divorce and stuff like that. Yeah. So, but yeah, I didn't I didn't take it personally. You know, I I um I was doing uh, coincidentally I was doing the Steve Harvey show a lot at the time. I did thirteen episodes. <laughs> uh -huh. That's ironic now, uh, but I did thirteen episodes of Steve's show, and uh, mm -hmm. my book had done well. And uh, I was like, you know, doing a lot of media and I, I was like, man, I got to get on with him. You know, this is really mm -hmm. was like where I wanted to be because it was, you know, your point of view and your perspective was very informative of my book and, and of my perspective and uh, very infused in my professional life as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just sent like a random email, you know, and I was like, there's no way it's just going to end up in his spam because <laughs> I got the word sex in my last name. So I end up in everybody's no. spam. So I'm really glad it happened, though, man. When yeah, I when yeah. I get, last night I'm sitting there and I'm watching uh, on my iPad, you know, because I've been a subscriber for a long time to to Rational Mail, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, you're on there talking about my video, and you said, "Man, we got to get this guy on," and I'm like, I'm yelling at my iPad, going, "I'm right here! I'm trying to get on." <laughs> so I know, great. I know. Well, you know, I tell you, it's funny. It's like I saw that, and I started getting uh, clips. Uh, maybe there were the TikTok clips from that. And like all my Instagram followers say, you got to get this guy on. You got to talk to this guy. You got to check out this video. And it was like all of like an hour on Software yeah. Underbelly. And I think for the last couple of shows that I've been doing, I I've been using like clips that you've been talking about. I think I riffed on it a little bit more than normal on last Sunday. And I'm like, I wonder if I could get this guy. And then you reached out to me <laughs> and I was like, oh man, I wonder, I wonder if he's read the book. And then of course, you know, we just, well, so I read all the books, yeah, I read so all the books, I read all four of the books. Oh, you did? Oh, okay. Okay. oh yeah. Every one of them. No. And I, and what's funny is you, uh, you were riffing on it and I thought, you know, mm -hmm. cause a lot of people have commented on it. It's, you know, I got a lot of offers. I'm, I'm actually flying out next week to do Lex Fridman's show and I'm doing, doing some other, you know, bigger things, which is very exciting for me. Sure. Um, but but the truth is, like, I, I've been waiting for this. Like, this is what I was waiting for. And so <laughs> when I saw you, it really was. And when I no. saw you talking about it and you spent a good amount of time and yeah. then you were only like 20 minutes into the video. So I was like, wow, I got like 40 minutes of like of you talking about 20 uh, minutes of my video. So I'm, I'm very happy, man. I'm very happy. Oh, uh, yeah, no, I um great. I really wanted to talk about Steve Harvey and his situation right now, but I don't know that it is necessarily like for real yet. I have too yeah. many people telling me it's been faked or it's a uh, it's just rumors, and God forbid I should uh, in any way like 
traffic and rumors. So. I would find it hard to believe. I have to tell you because I I was on you know Steve's show thirteen episodes and mm. I worked with him and um, I have to tell you I, I you know I mean definitely his mm. his affection for that woman is through the roof. I mean he he's a very very into her and it, by all accounts I ever saw she was very into him. Mm. So I I found this very surprising when I heard it and uh, I would not be surprised if it turns out that this is just like a hit piece or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's what I was a little I had to be real I'm I'm extra cautious these days. So uh but I what one thing I do know is Logan, are you familiar with Logan Paul situation? Oh yeah. Oh okay, well actually well, Dylan we Dylan that. <laughs> So Dylan Dylan Danis and I trained mm. together for many years at, at Marcelo Garcia Academy in New York City where oh. I train. I'm a brown belt under Marcelo for about 7 years now. I'm like mm. a lifetime brown belt. But uh, Dylan and I trained together for many years and I knew him for a long time. And, uh, you know, he, he's he's a character, always has been. He got kicked out of the gym at, at, at one point many years ago. <laughs> but uh, and, and then he was right. out on his own. But I've been watching this with great interest because mm -hmm. the, as the body count just keeps getting higher on this girl, um, up. you know, right. it's just I got to tell you, like, I. I I'm hoping Logan Paul watches the, my video on soft white underbelly. I'm just hoping I get a call from this guy. Cause even, you know, listen, man, you got to protect that stolen crypto zoo money, you know? So <laughs> you gotta, you want to give her half of that. You yeah. Know? Yeah. That's funny. I, um, yeah. So I've been, I've been watching with interest, the Logan Paul situation. Um, not the least of which, because I know that um, Mike Sartain is pretty familiar with him. And so I was, uh, I've been looking at this and watching the whole thing go down. And I think the, the number one thing that everybody keeps asking is like, is he going to get a prenup? Is he going to get a prenup? And I think that was one of the things that, the topics that you were hitting on, on soft white underbelly about like Anytime. getting a, getting a prenup. I want, I know there's going to be a lot of questions. And uh, by the way, if you guys uh, throw in your super chats, I'll definitely read every single one of them today. Um, but I wanted to uh, first uh, touch on the, the prenup situation. Um, I, I think quite, okay. So, Here's my take on this. I don't know that this is like the way that this is really going down, but are you familiar with what happened with Adam 22 and Nina? The oh, and all that oh stuff? Yeah. I mean, I haven't watched the video, but you know, I saw the yeah. preview of it and I, I feel like I, I got the plot pretty yes, good. Yes, so. yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew it had a happy yeah. ending for content everyone but purposes. him. Yeah, content yeah. purposes only, right? Yeah. Um, so, anyways, um, what I saw happening with Adam 22 was really what. Um, what I call engagement media. And these guys are really kind of coming up with um, uh, new, new ways of engaging people on a much like on a meta scale right now. So Adam 22 goes, he, I mean, he's already got a very large platform on no jumper. So he goes out there, makes this announcement and it sounds like it's legit. It sounds like he's like really upset or something, you know, he has destiny on the show and he's, you know, who's a notorious cuck himself. So they, he's asking him, Hey, well, how do you go about, you know, how do you feel when your wife goes and banks somebody else? And, and that kind of and wife goes and banks somebody else. And then of course it escalates and he gets in a fight with, uh, you know, what's his name? Um, forget uh jason jason love yeah, i think is his name um and you know it just escalates and it's 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 kind of like reality tv but everybody gets to play a part in it i kind of see the same elements it from what like adam was doing like business wise and sort of like wag the dog wag, you know tail wags the dog wag, wag the dog wise with um with uh, uh logan paul because everyone knows this girl's reputation. Everyone on planet Earth knows. Even Adam Sosnick from, from Saucecast. He, he has never had sex with Nina. Uh, you know, it's funny how they both named Nina, too. Um, but, had, but he knows four of his friends. And he said he has the pictures. I, I talked to him right after that clip uh, of his, his buddies who have dated uh, Nina Agdahl. So she's notoriously high, high body count. So what does that do? It allows people to sort of like talk about body count. Like think of all the, the sub, sub text, the sub plots that go along with that. So they know that people will hit on the, on the, uh, on the body count thing. They'll hit on the, uh, is this really marriage? Is it really love? And it's like, you know, he has this big production of him like proposing to her on you know, a beach somewhere in I guess Hawaii or something like that and making this big production out of this. And then goes on and proceeds to go on an interview to sort of defend her honor kind of thing. And everybody's saying, doesn't he see that she's like, you know, damaged goods that she, you know, she's been around the block a few times. And, you know, of course, he, he plays the, the dutiful beta. And I'm wondering how much of that is just bullshit. And I'm wondering how much of that is like, like maybe he is. But that's the thing the, me asking that question 
is the grift. That's the scam. Right. <laughs> is it real? Right. Is it not? Yeah. And what I'll say is that, that, you know, you can say what you want about Logan Paul. I mean, he, listen, he's, he's been excellent at what it is that he does, right? Which is creating mm -hmm. content that people talk about. And, you know, it, it's like Andy Warhol said, you know, don't, don't look at the comments, whether they're good or bad, just measure it in inches. You know, how much mm -hmm. are people talking about you? But I think at the end of the day, like the one thing that ties Logan Paul together with the the, the multi-millionaires I represent. Because look, I've represented celebrities and celebrities, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have a slightly different angle. Like they're not the wealthiest clients. The wealthiest clients I have are the people in finance and in real estate. Those are the people that could, they could buy 10, 20 celebrities net worths mm -hmm. um, because they, they don't have to put on the lifestyle and show the lifestyle that, that celebrities do. Celebrities have a lot of show money. Whereas people in finance and real estate, they actually kind of, you know, it's like, like, like they say that, you know, wealth whispers, you know, mm. real wealth whispers. So it, the truth is, I, I think that, that I've seen guys who are brilliant, like quant mm. guys at Goldman worth hundreds of millions of dollars in their forties who mm. fall for women who anyone on the street could say to you, this is not a person to tie in with. There are mm. 7.3 billion people on the planet and almost any of them would be a better choice than this girl. Mm. And these guys just do not see it. And these are brilliant, brilliant men. These mm. are men who are surgeons. These are men who are captains of finance, CEOs of huge companies that make Logan Paul look like a, like a flea. And they are hypnotized. They are completely ready to just go, no, no, she doesn't want a prenup and this is true love and there's nothing that I need to worry about. And these are people who make pragmatic big business decisions that affect hundreds of thousands of people that change the S&P 500 when they make a decision. And that's a decision they're making is going, no, no, I don't want to upset her. And, you know, we don't need a prenup. So I like the fact that Logan Paul, who's a kid, basically, you know, right, right, I, I'm right. not trying to say he's not a grown man. I don't know him. I've never met him. But he's young, you know, he's mm. a little older than my son. So mm. the truth is, like, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised that someone makes an unbelievably bad decision potentially. Mm. But listen, he's got every reason to have a prenup. And if he has a prenup, marry, marry your all, marry your all you want, man. Marry mm. as many people as you want if you got a prenup. If you got a prenup, go get married 50 times. There's nothing more fun Let's than getting married. I forget the uh, the interview he was on, but I think he was asked if he had a prenup, and he was like, "No, I don't." Like he was like offended by the by the question. Yeah, the problem I have with that is I can't tell you how many people who I've written their prenup who I see in the press talking about it. They don't have a prenup. I, I, I've got a half a <laughs> dozen do. people yeah. that, of course, they do. But here's the thing: no one, you don't file your prenup anywhere. Your lawyer has it. The other lawyer has it and the two of you have it and that's it. It doesn't get filed anywhere. So, so all these people that say, Oh, I don't have a prenup. I'd never have a prenup. Of course they have a prenup. Are you <laughs> kidding me? They're just not going to put it on Instagram. Like here we are signing the prenup. Like they don't do that because they you know, want to say, Oh no, we wouldn't. But what it does is it creates in people this mindset that, well, he didn't have a prenup and she didn't have a prenup. So why should we have a prenup? It's like, they had a prenup. They just don't want to tell you that they had a prenup. No. Their relationship isn't that good. So don't worry that your relationship isn't as good as their relationship. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, t I thought that was funny. Do you think, um, do you think that, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos has a prenup for but between him and Lauren Sanchez. I would bet both my nuts for that. I was going to say my left <laughs> nut, but both of them. There's no way he doesn't. Listen, he gave away sad. billions with a B. There is no way that man not have a prenup. <laughs> you know, listen, almost every person mm. I know who has been married and then got divorced and decides to get remarried. And as I said in the other interview, 80, 84 percent of people are remarried within five years of their divorce. Mm -hmm. And and so it's it's staggering how many people just do it again. But but so many of them do it with a prenup the next time. Mm -hmm. You know, you know it's I, always... I, I, I want to talk stats with you, too, because I, I, get a, I, get, I catch a lot of heat. And I, one of the things I quoted on you quoted you from uh, the lap from the soft white underbelly yep. interview, which, by the way, go watch the whole thing. I don't want to step nice. on their toes because I thought it was a really great show. Um, but you mentioned that the uh, the divorce rate right now is at 56%. Yeah, 56 is the latest percentage um, in terms of the average, right? And so mm -hmm. it skews where you hear this differing perspective other than the fact that people lie with statistics all the time mm -hmm. is that um, the, the percentages for second marriages, third marriages, fourth marriages obviously are much, much higher. So mm -hmm. what ends up happening is there's a lot of percentages um, that, that get broiled into that divorce mm -hmm. rate, right? So when someone says, well, what's the marriage failure rate? 
what you're really saying is, okay, what's the average divorce rate among first, second, third, fourth, fifth, you know, the full, whereas the divorce rate with first marriages is slightly lower than 56%. Now, again, I, I think this is a stupid statistic to talk about because that to me is just how many, you know, look at it like how many people does the disease kill? Okay, well, that's how many it kills, but how many does it cripple? How right, many right, does right. it make incredible? Because I don't think anybody looks at marriage like, oh, man, I want to get married and then it's just going to suck. But like it's an endurance event where I'm just going to hold on and then hopefully I can be miserable and stay miserable. Like the marriage satisfaction rate is mm -hmm. what people should be looking at. Like how many people who are married for an extended period of time say, you know what? I'm really glad I'm married. Like if mm -hmm. right now I could press a button and be happily divorced from this person, I know that they'd be okay and I'd be okay financially and our kids would be okay, but we just wouldn't be married to each other anymore. How many mm -hmm. people will push that button? And yeah. if, if you would push that button, don't be married. Don't get married because it, the marriage satisfaction is what's important. But think about it. If 56 percent of marriages end in divorce and on top of that, 10, 20 percent of people who are married stay married for the kids because they don't want to give away some other stuff or go through the process or they can't mm. afford to get divorced because getting divorced is so unbelievably expensive. Mm. What? Why would you sign on for that? And beyond it, why would you assume that people will sign on for it. Why would you say, oh yeah, if you don't do this, you must be afraid of commitment. You must have some kind of, of you must be a sociopath if you don't mm -hmm. want to engage in this specific right. kind of legal status. That's crazy. Right. It's absolutely right. crazy and devoid yeah. of any rationality. Yeah, I um, so I, I one of these days, maybe maybe when you come out to. By the way, uh, you're still coming out to Vegas at some point. We're gonna work absolutely. It out absolutely. So we can do a lot. We can actually do something a little more formal. Uh, just th there's your announcement. Um, but the. Uh, the, I would love to have Aaron Clary, uh, my friend Aaron. Yeah, I don't know if you're familiar with Aaron. He's part of Rule Zero. He would be a really good guy. To have. He's unique. He's an economist, so he like he, he's right. written a, a really great book called The Menu. And the menu sort of breaks down in dollars and cents and numbers, um, just sort of like the price of getting married, the price of getting a divorce, like all sure. of the sort of the so, the e economic aspects of it, because that's he's yeah. a numbers guy, right? Yeah. Um, but part of that, and, and I was, and I keep stealing his line all the time. I, you know, mercilessly. But um, uh, Aaron said we live in a post-marriage society right now. We just don't know it yet. We're still trying yeah. to do marriage in the 20th century sort of sense. And well, it's 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 interesting because you know one of the things you commented on on my video was about the, what I called the BPL analysis, which you know is in law school how you learn to analyze negligence and how you learn mm -hmm. to define what's called an inherently negligent activity. So there are some activities that are so dangerous that it's what's called negligence per se, which mm -hmm. means just engaging in it is negligent. And mm -hmm. the way that you determine that is what's called a BPL analysis. And I said in the video that it's the burden, it's, a, it's an equation, which is, sure. is the burden of not doing a thing greater than the probability of harm and the severity of harm, okay? Mm -hmm. So I, when I was in law school, I was already very interested in this subject. I wanted mm -hmm. to be a divorce lawyer. And I wrote an analysis of it using essentially the BPL analysis, which is meant for, for you know, like if your car is designed without a seatbelt, all right, what's the cost? What's the burden of mm -hmm. putting in a seatbelt versus the probability of car accidents and the severity of harm caused by car accidents? And that's how seatbelts got in every single car, right? Mm -hmm. So what I tried to do is I tried to say, all right, what are you giving up if you don't get married? What's the burden of not getting married? So mm -hmm. I actually did an analysis where I said, all right, think about it. What do you do when you get married? Well, you got someone to talk to. So, mm -hmm. you know, someone to talk to. And when you're first married, you got lots to talk about. But probably after 20, 30 years of marriage, all you want to talk about is like, what do you want to have for dinner? What do you want to watch on Netflix? So <laughs> what could we what would we have to pay someone to reproduce that? All mm -hmm. right. And sex. When you first get married, probably have lots of sex and high quality sex. But over the years, you might have less and less, and then eventually you have very limited amounts of sex. So let's see what it would cost to have a sex worker do that for us. Mm -hmm. And I basically tried to say, okay, versus what does it cost you to potentially get divorced? What mm -hmm. is the harm that's caused by getting divorced? And essentially, I, I, I argued that because of the probability of divorce, marriage is an inherently negligent activity like owning a lion or mm -hmm. having a trampoline mm -hmm. next to a toxic waste dump. <laughs> and and mm -hmm. the interesting thing is the BPL analysis was created by a Supreme Court justice named Learned Hand. That was his name, Learned Hand. <laughs> and interestingly enough, he is one of the only Supreme Court justices who never married. 
-hmm. So the name of the paper was, would there be a ring on a learned hand? And mm -hmm. I talked about the, the negligence of marriage. And I got to tell you, this is something that I think if we look at things rationally, pragmatically, like, like this is what you've urged in your work mm -hmm. that I, from day one of reading your work, was always very drawn to, which is, mm -hmm. this is not against love. This is not right. against pair bonds. This is not right. misogyny. This is not misandry. This is not that there is no romance in the world, that sex and love and all those things don't mean anything. Those are some of the best things in the world. But the question is, is do we just let that irrationality and total lack of pragmatism, do we let that control or do we let our rational minds? Because I don't think rational and romance are totally at ends with each other. Mm -hmm. I think oh, that yeah. you can have a romantic relationship, a great sexual relationship, a great partnership with someone and be pragmatic and be practical mm -hmm. and still have that wonderful connection. So, yeah. Well, if you've read, you probably read my fourth book, which was religion. There's a religion. big, fat, there's a big yeah. fat chapter in the middle of it called marriage based, based great, on, great chapter. on that. And um, I, I started off by um, sort of recounting my, uh, my interactions and my debates with uh, Dr. Everett Piper on uh, Pat Campbell's show back in the day. And of course I take the, the anti-marriage side and I, by the way, and I have a great marriage. I, I just right. celebrated 27 years and I'm probably one of the two or 3% that you, that we're talking about here. Yeah. But the, um, the, you won the lottery, you won the lottery. I, 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 I but here's the other thing is I understand female nature. I understand my own nature as a man. I understand the confluence of them together. So I'm like, I'm better off as a husband because I'm red pill. And I think I, that really kind of blows people's minds because they think that I can't be red pill because I'm married or I can't be married because I'm red pill, vice versa. Right. But the, uh, the thing that, that Dr. Piper and I talked about was the difference between a covenant marriage and a right. contractual marriage, a contractual marriage being in how we do it now, right? You have to go down to the courthouse, sign off on the papers and everything, and it's the state's involved and everything else goes along with that. Whereas uh, like my friend Abu American Muslim has, uh, you know, three or four, I think maybe he's up to four wives now, but it's a covenant marriage, meaning like it's just b before the eyes of God and his wife and uh, his wives and his families and stuff like that. There's no contract, no government's not involved in that. And it was interesting to listen to this guy who is all, you know, normatively a you know evangelical uh, pastor who's very pro marriage right and he's arguing for the fact that we need this we need the state involved because women need protections in it and all this other stuff and but i i thought it was interesting because then there's those two uh it's almost two different wants it's the want for a, a you know to be married to have that pair bonding to have that socially enforced monogamy but then there's also the fact that we have to bring the state in and then the state turns it into uh into a contract it's basically a well a hundred percent and your your point about covenant marriage look at you know one of your criticisms if you want to call it that of of my interview um was saying that you know i talk about how marriage is rooted in things like land ownership mm -hmm. and and the truth is look when you talk about covenant marriage well that that is of course like that who knows what the history of that is that's probably almost prehistoric i mean in terms of of people saying we're going to have some spiritual significance or theological significance to our pair mm -hmm. bond i'm sure yeah. that, that fa and, and creation of a family and birth and and, and offspring i'm sure that, that there's been before there was a state to grant a legal status of marriage on people, there was marriage as a concept. But that's the problem is we're not talking about, and when you say, and I, I totally agree, there was a time in the United States, and I'm sure in other countries, where women's role, when women weren't allowed to own land, when women weren't allowed to have bank accounts, um, you know, there was a time where women certainly did need those kinds of protections that marriage afforded. But just like always in this country, we, we solved dandruff with decapitation. You know, we, we said, well, women are not protected. So let's create a system that is so unbelievably one-sided in terms of the, the promises men make Mm -hmm. in a marriage are legally enforceable after the marriage and after divorce. But the promises mm -hmm. that the majority of women make in a marriage, which are, you know, love and respect and affection and sex, none of them are legally enforceable. No yeah. one in the state can force that person to do. No one can force that. But all the things you promise, protection, financial security, uh, care for the children, covering the cost of caring for the children, for the medical expenses of the children, all of those things are all enforceable by the full power of the state. Mm -hmm. That is a contract of adhesion. That's what you call that in law school. It is a that's, unconscionable contract. That's that right, that's, yeah. and, and it is what's an adhesion contract is a contract where the two people are not in equal bargaining positions. Right. And, and so when one 
end of the contract is enforceable mm -hmm. and the other side is not, that's a contract of adhesion. That's not a fair contract. Mm -hmm. And that's what modern marriage is. So adhesion or cohesion? Adhesion. Contract adhesion. adhesion. I got to look that I, I won't, I, I like to like, like, cause I, I, I became really familiar with all these legal term terminologies when I was writing that chapter yep. in, in religion. Yeah. And then of course I was talking about, uh, and I mentioned this in the last, in the last video, um, the coverture laws that existed yeah. back in like say the 1700s, 1800s, sure. or really up to the 20, well, yeah, the 19th to 20th centuries anyways. And the coverture laws were, uh, you know, women actually could own land. They could own money. They, could, they, inherited they, it. they could inherit it. Yes. They could own their father's businesses and things like that. They actually did have a lot more rights than most modern feminists who don't do their homework would understand. But that was because of the coverture laws during that time, which meant that you could have all that. But you, once you got married to your husband, your husband was legally responsible for you and re legally responsible for the children. So right. if your if your children became criminals, you had to be the one to be responsible for the. You were the one that was right. going to be as the father, right? right? right. Same thing for for women. And so ergo, and I made I made this this comparison here. Maybe you agree with this or don't. But the um, back in the back when the coverture laws were working kind of in men's favor. It was more women had more power and had more had uh, could own you know land had more control over their own lives and their own properties and stuff like that outside of marriage than inside of marriage. Right. Whereas today men have more power outside of marriage than inside of marriage because if you were just saying the full state the full power of the state could, like you can't out alpha the state. I'm sorry, but Black Bill right. Doomer, Nick Towers, you got a point. I'll give you a point. Okay, but. Um, the uh, it, it, I made that co that sort of like uh, contrast between those two, the coverture laws of like yeah. the 1800s versus, you know, where we are right now in the 21st century. Yeah, and it's an excellent point. But I, I think fundamentally, you know, look, I, I understand the desire to marry. I think that, that as I've said yeah. before, marriage is like the lottery. You're probably not going to win. But if you win, mm -hmm. what you win is so good that I understand people's desire to buy a ticket and try. Mm -hmm. But I, I also think, and that's what I mostly talk about in that interview, is that I just think people have to be able to talk to each other about what their expectations are mm -hmm. um, of each other, of the nature of that mm -hmm. relationship. And, and I, if you can't have that practical, pragmatic discussion, mm -hmm. I just think you have absolutely no business getting married. Yeah, I, I have, mean, I listen, have... I call it job security. Like, go mm -hmm. ahead, get, get married as many times as you want to. Like, we're here and we'll do your divorce and, and love is grand and divorce is a hundred grand. But, mm -hmm. you know, I just don't, I mm -hmm. don't understand why when a simple couple of thousand dollars prenup and a couple of uncomfortable conversations with a person that theoretically you like mm. more than the other 7.3 billion people in the world. Why, why I should be out of business. There, this should, mm. All I should be doing all day is writing prenuptial agreements and making yeah. a very modest income. Because we make almost, there is no lawyer who ever said, man, I got rich from writing prenups. Prenups are like a low profit business item for divorce lawyers. It is not something mm -hmm. that we do. Litigation is where we make our money. And, and so many of these divorces end in litigation. Mm -hmm. I don't think enough people really realize, I don't want to throw that, I've used this before. This is the decline. And this is just goes up to 2020. This is the decline in marriage rates in the United States from the, just from 1990 yeah. to 2020. So I, I, when you put it in, in, you know, black and white terms like that, um, you know, then you can also look at like, say the fertility slump, which is right here from, which by the way, starts right around 1971, which is right after no fault divorce is instituted in California. And then all these other states are following suit. Um, and then this is the one I actually wanted to show you right here, which is first mm -hmm. marriages ended annually per 1000 married couples date and duration of the marriage. This is where I get, I, I jump into, and the, by this, this is only like 2009 data. Yeah, this is way there's, old data. There's, there's, there's more than this now from, uh, from from the more recent census uh, data. And again, marriage satisfaction is really what matters. And you're not going to, by the way, you're not necessarily going to get real clarity from people on marriage satisfaction either, because the question mm -hmm. is, is compared to what? Compared to how they perceive other people's marriages to be? Mm -hmm. Or compared to the line we've been fed 
for so many. I mean, look at every sitcom that was ever on TV. It's the wife rolling her eyes at the stupid husband mm. and the man being like, well, I guess you're not going to have sex with me unless it's my birthday. You know, like all that mm. same, which is that <laughs> what we're aspiring to? Like what that young yeah. people would say, oh, yeah, in the prime of their lives. They go, you know what? Sign me up for that unbelievable shit show. Like I'll, I'll take that on. And, and, and that makes sense yeah. for me. But I think, again, there's a presumption that people are going to marry. And, and I think ignorance is a huge piece of it, because as I've said before and will continue to say as loudly as I can from the mountaintops, there is nothing else we do other than dying that is legally significant as marriage. It changes your inheritance rights, your property ownership rights, your rights mm -hmm. when it comes to retirement accounts, your rights when it comes to children produced of the, of, of the relationship, your obligations, it, it changes everything and no one explains it to you right. ever in advance. There mm -hmm. is no other contract. Somebody said, oh, well, student loans, they don't explain to you student loans. Guys, student loans, it's easy to figure out. We're gonna give you some money. You got pay the money back and there's an interest rate that that's not hard to understand if you need someone to explain that to you don't go to fucking college because you're not smart enough to even go to college <laughs> if you don't understand how math like that works but marriage someone explains to you that you've opted out of the title system like someone should mention that to you before you sign on the line that's dotted and right. no one does and that to me how anyone could enforce a contract that no one ever explained to the two people who signed it before they signed it and how that is the most enforceable and frequently, and we have an entire court set up to enforce that contract. The matrimonial part of any state Supreme or Superior Court is designed to enforce a contract that no one read. And even if they read it, all it said is I take this person to be my lawfully wedded spouse. Mm -hmm. No one knew what that meant. Next time you're around, talk to one of your friends who's married and say, by the way, you're married. Yeah, how long have you been married? There's, okay, tell me legally what happened when you got married. Legally, what happened to you? What rights mm -hmm. did you get? What rights did you give up? Explain uh, to me what that, I guarantee you, unless they they're a know. divorce lawyer, they won't know, or unless they've been divorced. And so, and why? Because that's when they, I teach those people that, mm -hmm. but I teach them that when they're in my office. Yeah, they're learning to, getting they're learning to fight in the fight. In the middle of the <laughs> in fight. The middle of the fight. To fight. That was the best it's line. Insane. That was the best line it's in the whole insane. thing too. It's insane. It's hey, I want insane. you to, I want you to change my mind on something here. Um, Go for it. So whenever I've heard people talk about getting a prenup and I'm going to read this super chat, I'll get to all the super chats in just a second, but, um, Actually, let me just do this one right now because this was too good. This sort of uh, dovetails into what I wanted to do here. This is good. Uh, I've heard prenups not being upheld. To what extent must one go to to avoid this, like claims of signing under duress, unenforceable clauses? Now, I don't know if you you probably have seen this, but I'm, oh, sure, yeah. you, I'm sure you've seen Divorce Divorce Incorporated, oh, yeah. the, the documentary oh, yeah. Divorce Corporate. Oh, yeah. There's oh, a yeah. whole section in there where it says that prenups are basically – they're they they do not work as well as people would like you to believe that they do. And because the, you know, child support, not, not, not going to ever be covered by like uh, right. uh, prenups. Um, and then, so can you like explain like yeah. how, yeah. how like assets are, are yeah. allocated versus yeah. in, in if, with no yeah. prenup and with a prenup? Yes. So it's a great question. And it's actually the first half of the consultation I do when I do a consult for a prenup. So somebody calls, they say, Hey, I'm getting married. I want to have a prenup. And the first thing I say is, okay, we're going to have a consultation where I'm going to explain to you your rights in the absence of a prenup. So here's what your rights and your obligations are in the absence of a prenup. And that way you can understand what you can change with a prenup because there are things you can change and things you can't. I saw Divorce Inc., a lot of the criticisms of it, very uh, the criticisms in it, very fair, very fair. Mm -hmm. But where it's messed up is, look, prenups are enforceable. There's a lot, yes, there are prenups that can get set aside. They get set aside. When you go on one of those websites where it's like, oh, I could do my own prenup for $100. You know, I don't want to spend $2,000 on a prenup. People want to save money in the dumbest places. Like this is the, mo the only thing more expensive than a good divorce lawyer is a bad one. So uh, the only more expensive than a good prenup is a bad one. A bad one costs you a lot of money. A good one, the most expensive prenup I ever did probably cost two grand, three grand. That's mm -hmm. ridiculous. When I do a divorce, I take a $25,000 retainer. And I work against that retainer. So you're, you're, it's so little money for such a big return. But the way they get set aside is, is, you know, duress, meaning if a person doesn't have counsel. So that's an easy fix because you just get someone to review it 
for this other person. So both of you have a lawyer, you've eliminated undue influence, you've eliminated duress as a defense. You can't claim duress against someone who's represented by counsel. So you hire someone as a review attorney to review this prenup for the person who you're marrying. The only other way that prenups successfully get set aside, really, there's two other ways. One is lack of asset disclosure, meaning that the person had no idea how much money you had or how many liabilities you had. And that's an easy fix too, because you just, any good lawyer attaches as an addendum to the agreement, a general outline of assets and liabilities. And we usually attach it at the last minute, right when people are signing. So it's attached, but no one can ruminate on it for too long. Mm -hmm. And then the last reason is language. Language issues all the time come up where someone, a lot of people marry people from other countries. And this is how Donald Trump's, one of his prenups got set aside um, when uh, Ivanka said, uh, you know, oh, I don't, I didn't understand English well enough when I, when I signed that prenup. <laughs> Meanwhile, she'd been educated in English. She spoke mm. fluent English. Every interview she ever had was in English, but she said, oh, well, legal writing is different than, right? So what do we do? It's an easy fix. Good divorce lawyers. We have a section of the prenup that says, you know, Thai is my, you know, Tagalog is my native language. Um, I have had the offer to have this entire agreement translated by a certified neutral translator. I freely, knowingly, voluntarily declined to do so. And then we attach a Schedule A, a translation of that paragraph into the person's native language. So they can't say, I didn't understand the paragraph that said I understood a paragraph because it's in their native language attached as a schedule. With that, prenups are binding. They can't cover child support. You're absolutely right. You can't dispose of the custody of children with a prenup and you can't dispose of child support with a prenup. And you're right. Child support is where people can get creamed in, in family court. But guess what? You don't have to be married to pay child support. You have a kid with someone, whether you're married or not, child support comes into play. So whenever anybody says like, oh, this NFL player, he got married. She's got him now. No, no. Not necessarily. If he has a prenup, which a lot of those guys do, we do a lot of athlete prenups. We do a lot of, if you have a prenup, no, she doesn't have anything on you. She can walk out as penniless as she was when she came into the thing. But you get a kid, that kid, that's golden ticket. That's you get off. pregnant, all bets are off. She owns you for 21 years. Kanye didn't even have a right when he said 18 years, 18 years. You got one of your kids got you for 18 years. It's 21 years. 21 yeah. years in most states is the age of emancipation. So yeah. that's where you got to watch out. But yes, prenups can't solve that problem. Okay, guys, you know what? One contract only solves like 99 of the problems that are caused by marriage. It can't solve one of the problems financially that's caused by marriage. So I guess we should mm -hmm. just throw prenups out the window. That's the dumbest logic ever. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense at all. It solves the overwhelming majority of financial issues that come from divorce. And it can't solve the one problem that can't really be solved by an attorney in advance. And that's child support. Well, all right, I got, uh, let me, let's go through some of these supers. Cause a lot of people, I want to ask you questions here. Um, do you think a lifelong, thanks for the super chat. Um, do you think a lifelong 50 year marriage is too monotonous, lengthy, boring, unnatural, and unrealistic for most millennials slash Gen Z's in 2023? Do I think that? Yeah. I, I don't, I have no idea. It depends on the people. I, I listen, I have people in my life that fascinate me no matter mm -hmm. how long I know them. I, I have mm -hmm. people in my life that, you know, I I've been friends with for 30 years, 40 years, and, and mm -hmm. I'm still find them as fascinating as I ever did. So marriages are about the two people that are in them. And, right. you know, to speculate, do I think people of Gen Z have a shorter attention span? Sure. Yeah. I have two sons. They're in their twenties. And, and, you know, they have a shorter attention span than me. I don't see them sitting and reading novels as long as I do, you know, and even my attention span has taken a hit. You know, I don't sit and watch a two hour movie anymore. I tried to watch The Irishman yeah. on Netflix. I was like, <laughs> kill me, you know, but but am I more mm. prone to watching a 15, 20 minute thing? Yeah. But if it's mm. interesting, the, the, it, there's like 21,000 comments on the YouTube of my soft, wet underbelly video. And mm. I would say 90 percent of them say, I, I can't believe I sat through this whole thing. Yeah. I never could sit through an hour plus interview and this thing kept me riveted. So mm -hmm. that tells me that if something's interesting, people will watch and pay attention mm -hmm. and they're not going to get bored. So mm -hmm. I, I'd like to think that relationships are the same way, that if there's mm -hmm. someone who is a, a great, again, I agree with your principle more than anything, Ro. Your, fir mm -hmm. your first book, I think, hit the nail right on the head, which is, I don't think that there's one person and that's your person and your mm. soulmate or whatever you want to call it. I think you could find satisfying, wonderful life with so many people in so many permutations. And if mm. we as a society looked at romantic relationships like chapters in a long book, 
where this chapter was with this person. We had a great life. I was married for over 10 years. I divorced when my kids were five and seven. My ex-wife is one of the nicest people I know, one of the coolest people I know. She's been remarried for, I don't know, 15 years, something like that, to a great guy who is nothing like me. He is the most <laughs> quiet, calm, patient guy in the world. And he's a therapist. And I'm like a type A insane going a thousand miles an hour guy. And, mm -hmm. and you know what? I, I love her. She's one of the great. And I told my sons when they were kids, and I'll tell them to the day I die, your mom was one of the great loves of my life. I'm so glad we were together. She is a great person I love that I would not want to be married to. And she mm -hmm. would say the same thing about me. Jim's a great guy who I would not want to be married to. We were 19 when we met, 22 uh, when we got married, 24 when we had kids. There so, it is. <laughs> you know, that's how well, it ends. But, but you know, again, does that mean she sucks and that I, I regret that I got married? Absolutely not. You know what? She was a chapter in my life, a beautiful chapter. I have found love since then, many, you know, many different relationships relationships where I felt deep connection and love. Do I need to marry those people? I, no, I don't need the state to get involved in me mm -hmm. being in a romantic partnership that's valuable to me and meaningful to me. I don't need the state to tell me what to do. And I don't need to have the state tell me that I have financial obligations to the people in my life. If, if mm -hmm. I say to you, I'm going to take care of you, I have a financial obligation to you. You have obligations to me. I have obligations to you. We're going to be, I'm a handshake deal kind of a guy. You know, I don't need to sign contracts to tell you, you know, my ex-wife, if she called, we've been divorced a long time. She calls me tomorrow and says, hey, I need your help. You got my help. You're on my team. You were here when I was nobody. When I was in law school, you were here. So you'll mm. you'll always be home team to me. So mm. I don't understand this idea that 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 you know it's either marriage is fantastic or there's no way marriage can be sustained and it'll never work out. Mm. I just don't see it as that binary. And I think when we look at things in that insanely black and white way, we're, we're it's a recipe for disaster. Mm. So I hope that there are people who you could meet and love for 50 years, whatever generation you're of. It sounds like you, you know, you've been married 27 years. Mm -hmm. I know your daughter just got married. Mm -hmm. Listen, man, I, I have a best friend. One of my best friends in the world has been married for 27 years, 28 years. I talked about him in the soft white underbelly interview. Mm -hmm. He, they are so happy. They are madly in love with each other, man. He talks about this woman who he's been married to has two kids with, he talks about her like a chick he met two minutes ago and he's just drunk on and he's no simp. He's nobody's like he is. She treats him like gold. She treats him like this is her boyfriend, you know, and she just is like mm. always trying to impress him. And you know what? Is she 27 years older or 30 years older than when we met? Yeah, sure. Is she aged? Yeah, he's aged. They love each other like they were just met two minutes ago because they have so much respect for each other. They've been through so much together. She went through the struggle of breast cancer, all kinds of other things. And he was right there with her through the whole thing. So I think it can be the greatest partnership. You know, every every love can be an amazing partnership, but people just got to go into it with their eyes open and continually one up each other. My buddy, man, he acts like mm -hmm. he is trying to close that deal with that woman every day. And she acts the same way towards mm -hmm. him. And if you yeah, can I do that, you're yeah. you're in. You're good. I was gonna, you know, was, what one thing I was noticing that when I watched your um your show, what well, uh, soft white underbelly, and then really what we're having the conversation we're having right now is there's kind of like two sides to this conversation. There's sort of the the um the human aspect of it. Like you were saying, you know, like men, I know that statistically it's men who want who actually remarry more often than women do. I think it's probably because you know women as they age they lose you know sort of sexual capital as sure. they do, but um. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that even guys who have been through two really bad marriages still get married and the, get a third marriage, right? They still right. want to have some, they want that that dream, really. They want that thing, like even like a- But that's women imposing their, I genuinely believe yeah. that women imposing their will on men. I, I don't know any man that said, you know, oh my God, I, I so want to get married. Like that's <laughs> ridiculous. Uh -huh. What it is, is I don't want anyone else to fuck her. That, that's a fact. That's yeah. what man, I, every man, I hear yeah, lots of men say make, that. Like, make, oh make no, I, yeah. I know if I marry her, I, it, she'll be monogamous to me, which is insane to think that that's mm -hmm. true. But but that's the thought is that, well, no, if I lock it down, she's mine. And, and this will mean she's mine and no one else can have her. And also I'm going to lose her if I don't marry her. I don't know men who go after we've been dating for a little while, you know, where is this going? 
Where is this yeah. going? That's not a man trait. Men don't say that. I don't know a lot of men that go, oh my God, when are we having kids? Like, wouldn't it be so great? Mm -hmm. You know, like it's just not, it, it really is something that is driven by women's expectations and desires. And again, I'm not criticizing. I understand, man. You Listen, when your stock is high, you leverage it. Like you better, you know, like this is, there's a time to do this and to lock somebody down. And once you have them locked down, Hey, realize that this is good. Like if you got a good thing going, keep it, keep it good. You know, like mm -hmm. he, this can be a really good symbiosis between two people, but to suggest that like, Oh, men are the ones who just can't wait to get married. No men mm -hmm. really seem to believe that they need to have one woman who is their person who's with them. And they don't want to disappoint that woman. And a lot of, listen, when my sons were young, I remember my, my son coming downstairs when he was like 14 and he had his first like girlfriend, you know, they'd hold hands or whatever. And he came down one day and he, she was, he looked a little upset. I said, you're all right, man. And he said, well, he said, you know, she's mad at me. And I said, what's she mad about? And he said, well, I, I was supposed to like, I was supposed to play world of Warcraft with Chris. And, you know, she yeah. said she wanted to hang out, you know, and I didn't know she wanted to hang out. So I made plans to hang out with Chris and I kind of wanted to play world of Warcraft with him. And I said to him, listen, buddy, I'm going to give you some advice. Learn how to disappoint a woman. Just learn how to disappoint a woman. Learn how to disappoint a woman respectfully. Learn how to say to her, you know what, babe? I appreciate that you wanted to hang out with me. And you know what? I'm going to look forward to hanging out with you real soon too. But today I made plans with Chris and I'm looking forward to doing that. And I'm not going to let Chris down and I'm not going to let myself down. I said, if you can learn to do that as a young man, your life is going to be way better. And if you care about that woman, you'll learn it's better to disappoint her in these little ways than to lie to her, give her what she thinks she wants just because she wants it, not because you want it. And eventually you will disappoint her in gigantic ways and you will have mm. destroyed your own life. So I hope they took that advice. Um, mm. You know, I think they did, you know, uh, so far neither of them is married. But, you know, I, I, I think that that is I don't think men are the ones who are pushing for marriage, even though you're absolutely right. Men are mm. very quick to get remarried after yeah, the divorce, yeah. even after I mean, they got annihilated in the divorce. Mm. I think there's, a, I think a, like a lot of guys, um, when it comes to getting remarried or maybe even getting married in the first place, they tend to be a lot more idealistic. It is, sure. I, I have, a, I actually have stats on this. I got to go dig them up. They're in my one of my archive folders, but they, um, they did this research on uh, couples, like who said "I love you" first. And it was overwhelmingly like 86, 80, almost 90%. It was the guys who said, I love you first. And that's, and then they went from there. Right. Um, and I would also argue that that probably has a lot to do with the 80, 20 rule and guys, you know, most guys are like sort of in a, in a position of sexual deficit, right? They're not there. Well, you know, call them beta males. That's fine. But they're the, the 80 percenters that don't have the same kind of sexual access. It's like say 20%. So it, it stands to reason that that might be, you know, they're, their idealistic nature or their idealism when it comes to love really. And then it, you know, comes into, you know, I want to marry her. I want to make sure that I lock this down because I don't know when my next meal is coming from, sure. when I'm, you know, I'm never going to find another girl as good as this girl. But, but what is any, what is mm -hmm. any of all, like, you know, the seven deadly sins, which, which is what one of my, one of my sleeves is actually the seven deadly sins as skull. <laughs> so each uh -huh. skull represents a difference of the seven deadly sins. And, and, and what I think is very interesting about seven deadly sins is all of them are normal human drives. Yeah. that are taken to the wrong level, right? So gluttony right. is right. hunger, normal, mm. the desire to enjoy food and have food, the need to eat, but taken too far. Like everything is a function of like, like lust is look, the natural mm. desire for sexuality, mm. for sexual connection taken yeah. to a far of a level. Okay. So right. why, why isn't it possible that, you know, when a man says, I love you first, is it that he loves her so much that he's bursting with it and he has to say it? Or is it a, perfectly understandable desire, which is to make your partner happy, to mm -hmm. see a woman smile, to see a woman feel good. Listen, I'm, I'm a, a heterosexual male. I see a beautiful woman. I want to open the door for her. And when she walks through and she smiles, it makes me feel good. I like, I like to, to feel the mm -hmm. excitement of a woman. I like to feel, a, a make a woman happy. I like mm -hmm. to have a woman make me happy. I think these are very normal human drives. Anybody who says mm -hmm. otherwise, there's something wrong with them. You know, yeah. so ple giving and receiving pleasure from, from a woman, if you're a heterosexual male or, or from another man, if you're gay, like this mm -hmm. is what, you know, we're wired that way, but it's a drive 
that is taken to a pathological level when it turns into things like, oh yeah, I'm going to tell her I love her. Oh yeah, I'm going to marry her. I'm going to, I'm going to propose to her because it's, it's like, well, it's cheaper than flowers. I'll just tell her I love her. Like I don't have to do it in advance. I could just say that. And when I say it, that's going to make her so happy. What's going to make her happy because you're also getting like, it's that roller coaster starts ticking up and up and up. You know, I'm, I love you. We should maybe move in together. Well, we moved in together. Maybe we should get engaged. Well, we got engaged, man. We're going to set a date. Hey, we set a date. We got married. Hey, when are we going to have kids? And we get it up. And before you know it, you are on that ride and you are strapped in by the state. And now, you know, I hope I put, throw your hands up. I hope you have a nice ride because it is no longer in your control. Yeah. See, that's what I was going to say is like, I think there's two sides to this, like the conversation. And there's the the want is sort of the human in need for it and the uh, evolutionary, biological, and even, you know, like maybe even philosophical, maybe even, you know, sort of metaphysical want to to be with another person. I get that. And then there's the other side. The other side is probably the ugly side that you see a lot of every day, which is we have litigated this. We have we've made all these attached all these rules and we built up this industry from the time that you go and you buy the wedding ring at Zales oh, to the time chicken. that they're paying you their final fees for divorcing them at the end. And it's this machine. That's why I call you know the divorce machine. But it's not just the divorce machine. It's also the marriage machine, too, because Lord knows I know how much a wedding costs these oh, days. Yeah. And it's very expensive. It's very spending. Uh, there's a uh, some sent me a. They sent me this map of all the states of the United States and how much the average marriage costs in each yeah. one of the states. And I think in like California, it was like seventy grand. I'm like, holy shit! I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story that I've I, never got told. A, I got off easy. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. I never. I've never told anyone, and I didn't mm. even put it in my book. So this is an exclusive. So I. When I first started as a lawyer, I knew I wanted to be a divorce lawyer, but I didn't have a pot to piss in or a window to throw it out of. I borrowed five grand, 2,500 from one of my friends, 2,500 from my dad, and I started my law firm. I used to hang around at the courthouse with a yellow pad, like pretending like I looked like a lawyer and I was a lawyer, but like I didn't have any clients. And I just would do whatever I could to like find people that had legal issues. And then I built that up into the firm that I've, I've now had for 20, 23 years. But one of the things that, that, that early in my career, I was um, looking to, to figure out like unconventional ways to market myself. So I thought, you know, everybody, when, when you go out on your own as a lawyer, people are like, oh, well, you should join like the divorce lawyers group, you know, in the bar association. Mm -hmm. I was like, why would I do that? Those are all other divorce lawyers. Those are my competition. Like, it's nice to meet them and get to know them, but they're not going to hire me. They're not going to send me any business. They're going to keep the business. So I was like, all right, people probably need, when you're going through a divorce, you probably get a personal trainer. So let me find some personal trainers in New York City. And I'll say to them, hey, you know, um, when I work with my divorce clients, which didn't exist at the time, when I work with my divorce clients, I really think that it's good for them to have physical outlet of exercise. I'm a marathon runner. I do jujitsu. I'd really like to have mm -hmm. someone I could refer them to. And by the way, if you have any clients that are dealing with marital issues, here's my business card and my information. And that's how I built my practice. So practice started doing really well. I did the same thing with therapists. I did the same thing with, so I found like, what are the professionals that people going through divorce work with? So then I thought, Hey, you know what? Prenups, they have all these wedding expos. And all these wedding fairs at hotels, mm. you know, where you, <laughs> brides go and they, oh, with this bakery and this photographer and this uh -huh. videographer. So I was like, great, like I'll pay five grand for a table, just like everybody. And mm. I'll just do talk about prenups. I, I won't say, oh, by the way, here's I'm your divorce guy when this fucking thing falls <laughs> apart. I was like, I'm just going to talk about prenups. I'll be very positive. <laughs> You're like the angel of death waiting for them. <laughs> I, I tried. Mm. 25 different wedding expos, wedding fair, not one would let me rent a table. Not wow. one, not mm. one would let me rent a table. Like my money's as green as anybody's. They mm. would not let me do it because the wedding industrial complex mm. does not want you to think about divorce at all. It doesn't exist. And meanwhile, I'm like, wait a minute, this is actually more important than the cake. This is more important than the photographs, like having a prenup. I'm not going to promise. I'm not going to gloom and doom. I'm going to come in and just be like, hey, you know, have your prenup. It's time to talk about the prenup. I'll make it cute. I'll have like a whatever. I'll make it cute. I'll give up balloons. I don't know. They they would not let me in there. So it really is about do not talk about it. Don't mention it. 
Just mm-hmm. go along with the fairy tale and the fantasy and don't talk about reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was going to say, that's actually brilliant marketing, I was going to say. But it's yeah, almost- If it would have worked, I should have made a table outside. <laughs> you know, like I should have been like- like the Grim Reaper, like with a yeah. scythe, you know, waiting yeah. for, the, for the yeah. next yeah. one. Yeah, you know what? Um, next time I'm at a, they have a wedding expo, I'm going to have a Grim Reaper costume and just stand outside <laughs> of the wedding expo with it, you know? Hey, uh, let me whip through some of these. These are really sure. good. Um, do women have healthier and more logical expectations of marriage, i.e. it's a short-term thing, and filing for divorce is fine once they have achieved their goals, such as a diamond ring, house, and kids? That's not been my experience. I I actually, I generally tell my clients, particularly men, when they are looking to fight for custody of their kids, Mm -hmm. um, I tell them that one of the good things that's changed in the 23 years I've been doing this is that women and men are treated more equally when it comes to their role in the lives of children. Like Mm -hmm. in terms of uh, courts have started to really recognize, like the maternal presumption was eradicated in the 80s, what was Mm -hmm. called the tender year doctrine, which basically said that if a child was under the age of seven and they were in the tender years, that they were presumed to be in the custody of their mother. All that's been eliminated by statute. And most judges now give men a fairer shake. I won't say a fair shake, but a fairer shake when it comes to custody. But what I always tell my male clients in particular is um, women fight harder for custody. And it's Mm -hmm. not because women love their children more than men do. It's because think about it. If if you and I are out in the world and we meet and I say, yeah, um, I'm divorced. I see my kids Wednesdays for dinner and every other weekend. You would go, oh, he's a divorced dad. You know, he's probably a busy guy. He's got a career, you know, but your kids live with their mom. If I'm a woman and and I say, oh, the kids live with their dad and they see me for dinner once a week and every other weekend, you go, what the fuck is wrong with this one? Like she was she on drugs? She had mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. women understand that if they don't have primary physical custody of their children, a there's a perception that they are not a good mother or that there's something wrong with them. And B economically, you don't get child support. If you don't have pri- if you don't have the kids more than 51% of the time, there is a tremendous economic loss in the form of A, not receiving child support and B, having to pay child support. So yeah. it's a tremendous, tremendous. So, so women, I don't think have a more laissez-faire, lackadaisical attitude, like once they got the ring and they got the kids. But what I will say is women definitely realize their power And that is that the promises that they, a lot of the benefit they receive from their spouse during a marriage, particularly marriage with children, the Mm -hmm. state can force them to continue to receive even after a divorce. So -hmm. they know that they have more leverage. You know, if they're the primary physical custody parent and they are a stay at home mom or economically, they're what we call the non moneyed spouse or the party with a lower earning capacity or lower Mm -hmm. earning potential, um, they, they are they are protected by the state in a marriage or even in a childless, you know, in a child situation where they're not married. So a situation mm-hmm. where you have kids and you're not married, they're more protected. So I think women are more fearless of divorce than mm-hmm. men are. Men should be afraid to get divorced. Majority of men should be afraid of what it's going to look like to get divorced. I, okay. Now I have a question. I, I was going to get to this anyways, and I haven't seen it in the super chats just yet, but, um, I don't know. They didn't ask you this on soft white underbelly. I don't know if Lex Friedman will either, but I'm going to throw this out there. You'll get it here. Um, Go for it. Now we, I I've been, I've been called to the carpet and so have a few other people that I associate. I've been called to the carpet for like repeating all of these stats about like uh, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to sex, when it comes to body count and all that kind of stuff. So I have you here. How long have you been practicing law? 23 years. 23. How old do you know? 51. 51. Okay. So we're about this. We're in the same generation. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, when myself or Myron Gaines or Ed, actually or, or even um, uh, Aaron Clary, anybody in the in this space quotes this stat, it's always uh, seventy to eighty percent of women are the ones who seventy percent to eighty percent of divorces are initiated and filed by women. Is that mm-hmm. accurate? One and then two, why would that be? Why is why? What's the reasons behind that? Yeah. So, so the majority of divorces are filed by women. I don't know the percentage currently for that, but it is quite a bit more than 50% are mm-hmm. filed by women. Now I, I would not try to say to you, cause I've never studied it and I don't think anyone ever has, and I don't know how you could study mm-hmm. why that is. So mm-hmm. a lot of what I talk about in my work and in my book and in, in my, you know, worldview 
is what I see as a divorce lawyer. So I represent men, I represent women, I represent the person who cheats, I represent the person who's been cheated on, I represent the person with substance abuse issues, I represent the person married to a person with substance abuse issues, I represent victims of domestic violence, I represent perpetrators of domestic violence, because that's how our system works, is everyone's entitled to representation. So I represent my clients and they come from all walks of life, men, women, you know, older, younger, religious, not religious, I represent all kinds of people. What I will say, I have definitely observed when it comes to women is that women are more comfortable moving forward with a divorce because they, they, they are going to receive the protection of the state in a divorce. You know, mm -hmm. men are more likely to engage in what we jokingly used to call an Irish divorce, which is you go out for milk and never come back. You know, you mm -hmm. just leave <laughs> and you're not asking the state to enforce anything on your behalf. You say, let me see the kids. If she says, no, you can't see the kids. You go, okay, you want to do that to the kids? I'm sorry that you're doing that. And then eventually she goes, all right, all right, you can see the kids. Like you don't go to the state to enforce this situation, to deal with this situation. So women are more likely to incur the or seek the protection of the state because they have, because of the nature, again, of how our society has been and the roles of men and women in marriages, which again, are changing and shifting in some ways. But that is one of the reasons why women are more prone to doing it. Now, the other thing you have to ask yourself too, though, is because just who's more willing to start the paperwork is really right. not, to me, that relevant, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're filing a divorce, it doesn't mean you wanted a divorce. If he runs off with another woman and is shacked up with that other woman and is not paying the bills and you file for divorce, does that mean you wanted the divorce? No, he wanted the divorce. You wanted the protection of the state or mm -hmm. you wanted the force of law behind his obligations. And by the way, I am not going to say as a divorce lawyer who's represented women who are married to some atrocious men, like there are men who perpetrate domestic violence. There are men who use economic leverage in cruel, vicious ways. Like I have clients who their, their husband sexually abused their children. So I'm not going to sit here and say, like, I, I do not believe red pill. I do not believe any of these things mean that, that women are wrong or that there's misogyny mm -hmm. like inherent in this. I Listen, man, you have a daughter and your daughter should be protected. And I'm mm -hmm. sure you as a father protect your daughter. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The law, thankfully, protects your daughter when she's married in certain ways. And it's supposed to protect your, your son-in-law as well. Like it's mm -hmm. supposed to, the law protects us. I like the law. I'm a fan of the law. That's why I do mm -hmm. what I do for a living. So mm -hmm. I think women, definitely the statistic is correct. Women file actions more often. What the problem is, and I've seen you do it, but not as brazenly as some other people do. Mm -hmm. um, they use that to say, oh, look women get married and then they kind of suck they're, the juice out of the orange. And they, mm -hmm. Right. And, and, and I don't know that that's true because I have a lot of women who come into my office destroyed over the fact that they have to file for divorce mm -hmm. and they do not want to get divorced. But mm -hmm. their husband has that because if one person in the marriage decides you're getting divorced, you're getting divorced. Mm -hmm. And this this logic that's been out there lately, because some of these people like Matt Walsh and some of the mm -hmm. other Daily Wire people are like, oh, it's no fault marriage is to blame. Okay, that's the dumbest thing <laughs> I've ever heard anybody say in my life. And, and Matt Walsh mm -hmm. says a lot of dumb shit. So that's mm -hmm. really saying something. But when he says, oh, no fault divorce is to blame, that's insane. No fault divorce, it, that's like saying like parachutes are to blame for, for, for plane crashes. Like, mm -hmm. no, no fault divorce saves everybody a lot of time a lot of time before that mm -hmm. when i practiced law when i first started practice first 10 years of my practice new york was not a no fault state and we used mm -hmm. to have fault trials where you would go in and have to talk mm -hmm. about why you're getting divorced and mm -hmm. whether this person slept with you or not and whether there was any physical impairment that prevented their ability to sleep with you and it wasted time and money and by the way as a lawyer i used to weaponize it all the time i mm -hmm. would say hey she only has twenty thousand dollars let's do a fault trial let's burn the 20 grand that she has on that and then when we get to financial discovery she'll be totally out of money mm -hmm. and we'll run her over and when mm -hmm. the state said okay we're going to be no fault like most states are mm -hmm. we all as divorce lawyers were like good that's actually better for people yeah it saves time i um i, I actually have done shows on this when i was researching i was doing a i'm still working on it right now this uh I don't know if I'm going to turn it into a book or something, but it's like, it, it'll be like 1971 and it, essentially right around that time, like 1965 to 1975, right after the advent of hormonal birth control in 1965. If you, again, 
correlation is not causation. I get it. But if you look at the stats for the uh, the increase in use of hormonal birth control and the rise in divorce from 1965 to really, you know, eh, about the mid 80s, maybe the mid 90s, uh, it just skyrockets, levels off, and then it falls as the rate of marriage falls as well. But the uh, my, you know, theoretically speaking, uh, once women had, uh, you know, uh, the ability to uh, decide whether they wanted to have a kid or not, and then of course you have like Roe v. Wade, you know, in the wake sure. of that, um, then you see this rise in the spike in divorces, and then right around what was it, 1968, when Ronald Reagan. Uh, instituted no fault divorce in California. It's exactly what you're saying. It wasn't because yeah. of, you know, we're just, it was to expedite all of the divorces that were happening right. as a result. They're happening of, anyway. Well, that they're, they're happening, happening anyway. Right. Right. And, 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 yeah. and it, that's why it's so funny, you know, when I'm, I'm sort of vaguely looking at the comments as they pass through and somebody mm -hmm. said, oh, his position on no fault divorce is disingenuous. No shit, guys. I'm a weapon. <laughs> I'm a weapon. Figure mm -hmm. that out. Yeah, everything I do is disingenuous because uh -huh. I'm a weapon. I, I'm a divorce lawyer. You point me at someone mm -hmm. and I go after them. So mm -hmm. I'm going to hit them over the head with anything I can. So if you put fault in a state and say, okay, we're going to be a fault-based state, I'm going to figure out how do I use that to my client's advantage. So yes, that is disingenuous. You want mm -hmm. a disingenuous divorce mm -hmm. lawyer. If you go, <laughs> you know who I want is my moral compass, a divorce lawyer. There's something <laughs> seriously wrong with you. Yeah. Uh, let me, okay. Let me uh, get to, I got I have one more question for, Actually, I'll just ask it right now. Uh, just as a follow up question for uh, the, uh, you know, 75%, let's just round it off. 75% of uh, divorces are initiated by women. Um, like, and I've, I've been called, like I said, I get called to the carpet for this as well, because I think a lot of people think that when we quote that stat, it means that we're saying that this woman is just trying to, like you said, suck the juice out of the orange, be done, sure. and then move on to the next thing. I actually went and did the research on this uh, because I remembered some posts from my friend Dal Rock, who used to actually study this kind of stuff. And I think part of this ended up in my my fourth book. But the uh, the idea was this, is that if you go like the average length of a marriage from saying your you know, wedding vows to the time that they're they end up a divorce is uh average is between uh wait five to nine years so yeah, it's five like to nine years. so seven years in the, in between yeah. there and then when you take that and you you look at it throughout like say from the 60s all the way up to you know the 2020s uh it follows a very similar pattern so when uh women are between the ages of say like what was the the most the average age of first marriage in the united states for women is about 28 to 29 for men it's about 30 yeah. 31 right now so when you look at it in those terms, that woman, if it, if the divorce happens in seven years and she's 28 or 29, she's about what, 36 years old, 35, 36. Yep. And so the, the logic is this, it follows this pattern that women are incentivized and maybe, maybe wrongly so. Maybe they don't realize that they will be worse off after having made that divorce so that they can yeah. go follow the eat, so, pray, and so, love, you know, that, the divorce porn narrative. That's where mm -hmm. that's you, that's that's gold that just came out of you right now. Mm -hmm. So so the truth is, I actually think from my observation from from sitting at the desk and across from the people getting divorced, I actually mm -hmm. think that that five to seven year is fairly easily explainable. And it maps mm -hmm. with kids. It maps yeah. with kids. People mm -hmm. get married. They have kids two, three years after they get married. Those kids, when they're three, four years old, you know, look, the honeymoon's over. The, the like mm. excitement is all over. Being a parent is challenging. You know, it's taxing on you physically. It's taxing on you mentally. It's taxing on you financially. And who do you, who do you lash out at? Who do you get annoyed by? The person who's in the house with you and that you, you kind of blame your lot in life on, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I get it. Like I get it. And people are what, 36, 37. Okay. You're not a kid anymore, but you're not quite old, but you're not quite young enough anymore that you feel like mm -hmm. what you do has no consequences. So that's again, like the midlife crisis for men and mm -hmm. for women. And by the way, as a divorce lawyer for 23 years, I can tell you women have tremendous midlife crisis and, mm -hmm. and, and they, they have absolutely like that same sense of, but here's what I'll say is what's happened now, what's happened now is there has been a tremendous infusion of eat, pray, love, voyage mm -hmm. of self-discovery for mm -hmm. women. 
not for men. Okay. Mm -hmm. If a man cheats, he's a piece of shit. If a woman cheats, mm -hmm. a man's a piece, of, a shit piece of shit <laughs> because he failed to meet her needs. Mm -hmm. And for him, he's can't control himself and he's an animal. A woman, she's on a journey of self-discovery and she had to find mm -hmm. the truth of what's in her heart. And, you know, and so the truth is like, we have just eliminated any accountability on that stuff. And we're encouraging terrible behavior. You know, one of the things that, 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 well, you know, 75% of women file for divorce or initiate divorce mm -hmm. proceedings fails to recognize is that a lot of women would be economically far better off to stay married. You, you cannot mm -hmm. cut something in half and have it be bigger than it was. It doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. It's at best half the size. And usually you'll lose something in the cutting, especially if you each spend a couple hundred grand in legal fees. Like mm -hmm. I, I get people's retirement account. Like I get mm. the equity in their house and my opposing counsel does too. Mm. And trust me when I say, you know, one of the things people unfairly say all the time is, oh, well, divorce lawyers have every reason to stoke the conflict. You're right. Mm. But you know what? We don't, guys. We don't have to. I'm never bored. I'm never sitting around like, man, what am I going to do? I can't find any clients. Like we all have way more clients mm. than we need. There's only so many hours of the day. And the only thing I can sell is my time. So there's only so many hours in the day. And unless I want to have 15 associates and manage all of that, the truth is none of us have to churn cases. None of us have to stoke up the conflict. People stoke up the conflict themselves. That's like mm. saying, oh, you know, cops get paid to, to do with criminals. So they must be out there encouraging people to turn into criminals. That's fucking stupid. That's just not <laughs> true. It's not necessary. You know, I don't make it rain. I have the umbrella and I sell it to people. That's how it works. But, but women, most of the women I deal with, if they were able to remain happily married, and I'm not saying it's their fault that they're not happily married. There, there are a lot of men probably assholes and be hard to be married to them and you couldn't be happy to be married to them. But if, you, if a woman could stay happily married, she is usually economically in a better position than if she got divorced. Like when I say to men, here's what you're going to pay in child support, yeah, there are some men who go, shit, that's a lot of my money. But a lot of men go, wait, that's it? Like, that's it? I pay that amount and then that's it? I don't have to pay anything else? And I go, yeah. And they go, what about my kid's cell phone? I go, no, that's included in the child support. Well, what about when the kid needs an allowance? No, no, it's in the child support. Mm -hmm. What about my daughter needs a prom dress? No, that's in the child support. <laughs> like, they go, oh, mm -hmm. dude, where do I write the check? Mm -hmm. Like, are you kidding me? Like, I, I've been paying the bargain. way more than... Yeah. I have guys who come in and they say to me, oh, man, we split up a few months ago and temporarily I agreed to pay her X number of dollars. And I look at the calculation and I'm like, you're paying her like three times what you owe her under the formulas. And they're like, are you kidding me? Because they're so used to spending so much on their spouse that they actually think that's normal. You know, so a lot of women, when I say to them and women, by the way, people come in for consults. A lot of women come in for consults and I go over with them what their rights would be in the event mm -hmm. they get divorced. I never see them again. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think it's that they didn't like me and they hired somebody else. I think a lot of times they look at it and they go, oh, shit. Yeah, this whole eat, pray, love thing is not going to work out for me financially. I'm actually doing better <laughs> mm -hmm. to just put up with the guy, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and very often that's what I think people choose to do. I see miserable. I, I got, I, I got to get to this one, but I got, I have a follow up for that too, but this was too good not to, not to give you Uh, hold on. There you go. Thank you, Jake, for your $100 super chat. Uh, questions for James. Uh, when it comes to protecting premarital assets and businesses from divorce, can a recoverable trust provide additional protection over just a prenup? Yeah, the short answer, Jake, is yes, a revocable trust can help. Uh, LLCs that are owned by a trust can help. A GST, which is generation skipping trust, all those things can help. Um, but a prenup is the most solid first defense. And sometimes you don't even need those. It's like suspenders and a belt. Like, yeah, could I wear suspenders and a belt to make sure my pants don't fall down? Sure. Do I need it? No. Have a belt that works. You're going to be fine. Or have suspenders that work. You'd be fine. So a prenup, first line of defense. But, you know, LLCs that own the real estate or own the business and then trusts that own the LLCs or the real estate. Absolutely. There's so many in the higher net worth space that, you know, we get into as lawyers, the more we work with people's accountants and trust and estates attorneys to help make sure that they're shielded not only from taxes, but also that they're protected in the event of divorce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is a recoverable trust? Revocable trust. A revocable, revocable trust is a, is a contingent interest, essentially. So it's mm -hmm. a trust in which certain beneficiaries are named, but those beneficiaries aren't necessarily locked in legally. So it's mm -hmm. a contingent interest. Now, the big mistake people make 
is everybody thinks they're like Tony Soprano. So everybody thinks like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I knew I was going to get divorced. So I sold my Ferrari to my brother for $5. Like, and now she uh, can't have it. He's going to give like, it back to me. Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, right, man. We're never going to figure that out. You're the first person to think of that one. And when we say to the judge, oh, yeah, judge, he did have a Ferrari, but he sold it to someone. Two dollars. Who? <laughs> oh, uh, a, a guy who has the same last name as him. How much was it? Um, oh, it was like five dollars, but it had like a dent in the one part of it. And the judge will go, "Well, that seems fair to me." Like that's not how mm. it works, guys. Like you, you really like no one. You're not that clever. There, it just doesn't work that way. So then yeah. there's a uniform fraudulent conveyances act applies. You get in trouble for trying to do those kinds of fraudulent <laughs> transfers. So like, there's mm. lots of things you can do that are that are legal and make sense in terms of divorce proofing some of your assets, particularly before marriage. Again, mm -hmm. guys, before marriage, like if you do this stuff before marriage, it's a whole lot easier than trying to do it during marriage. You know, it's much harder to do once you've already signed on the line that was dotted. Yeah, all right, let me get this one. Uh, what would you say are the most important qualities in a wife to avoid divorce? I would say she needs to be agree agreeability, calmness, patience, mental and emotional stability, but what do you think? Yeah, I think well, those are all good traits. I think sex is big. I think sex yeah. is the glue. Right. I, I, a lot right. of men who come into my office, Say it again. They, they, <laughs> sex is the glue. Mm -hmm. Sex is the glue. It really is. Listen, otherwise it's a fucking roommate. You know, that, that description, agreeable, generous, you know, clean, neat, nice. You just describe my roommate. Like when I was in college, he's a nice guy. We're not going to fuck each other. And I'm not mm -hmm. going to marry him, you know, even though legally I could marry him. You know, the truth mm -hmm. is that, that it's your romantic partner is your romantic partner because they're your sexual partner. Mm -hmm. They're meeting your needs in that sphere. And if you say to most guys, you know, is she a great cook or is she really great in bed and really meets mm -hmm. my sexual needs in a consistent way? Um, you could get takeout, man. And you know what? You could get mm -hmm. takeout when it comes to sex, too, but it's a lot more complicated and a lot more costly. Mm -hmm. and it's a lot more frowned upon and people have issues with that kind of like ethical non-monogamy. So at mm -hmm. the end of the day, I would say all of those traits that he named are very important traits to have. But I would add mm -hmm. to it that there is a sexual chemistry, that there is a clarity of expectation mm -hmm. between two people in terms of, of what they expect in the in the romantic and sexual sphere of that relationship mm -hmm. and having those needs met and figuring out how to talk about it. When those needs aren't being met, whether in a temporary way or in a long term way, I think that's really, really important. And it's huge. And it's the reason why when men come into my office, I do not have women who come into my office with any frequency mm -hmm. saying, yeah, we're just not hardly having sex. And that's why I want a divorce. Men all the time <laughs> come in mm -hmm. and it's either we're not having sex and I want the divorce or I started sleeping with someone else because we weren't having sex and now I want a divorce. Mm -hmm. And so it's tied to that. So, so let's be honest and rational about mm -hmm. that. Let's be pragmatic about that. Let's be honest with ourselves and with our partner. But ideally, again, before we get married, yeah. because it's as advertised then. Like if I say to my prospective spouse, or cohabitation partner, if I say to them, listen, here's what I expect of you. Here's what I would like from you. Here's what it takes for me to feel satisfied and happy in this relationship. And here's what I'm willing to give. Here's what we owe each other. Do you agree that that's what we owe each other? That that's what should be meaningful? I think that's a very useful conversation to have. And anybody who says having a conversation about what you expect from each other and what you want from each other is like simping or that, that's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. There's nothing more powerful, I don't think, than, than being knowing your own, what you need, what you want mm -hmm. and being candid about it, you know, yep. because there is a case to be made for monogamy. There is a case mm -hmm. to be made for not running around chasing skirt, you know, 24 seven, you will lose, you know, you will lose a lot of money chasing women. You will not lose a lot of women chasing money. So I, I really believe genuinely that, that there's a case to be made for pair bonds and monogamy, but marriage is an entirely separate thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, well, I get this question quite a bit too. And I, like when they asked me like, how did you vet for Mrs. Tomasi? And I said, I vetted myself first, uh -huh. meaning like, Am I going to cheat on this girl? Because I know me. I've seen me do it. I, is she somebody that I can remain faithful to? And fortunately, the answer has been yes for 27 years right now. But I, I got a question I'd, I've wanted to ask you for a long time, Roland. And I'm sure. really thrilled to get the opportunity to ask it. Because I ask it in my book of people. And I ask them to ask mm -hmm. it themselves. And you're someone, mm -hmm. like you have every reason to not be married. Mm -hmm. As far as I could see, like you understand this 
system, this game, the reality of men and women, I think better than the overwhelming majority of people. I've mm -hmm. always been so impressed with the work and, and your perspective on it. So the question I always say to people is ask yourself, what is the problem to which marriage is a solution? Exactly. And I would like to know for you, what is the problem to which your marriage was or is a solution in your know, mind? You know, I don't really, I never looked at marriage as sort of a problem solving like instrument, I guess. Okay. I've always okay. looked at, I've looked at, okay. So when I met my wife and we were, uh, you know, we we're dating, we were dating non-exclusively for, for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And then it got to the point where she was like, I don't like the idea of you sleeping with other people. I want to okay. be exclusive with you. And I, and she was asking me, I didn't, I wasn't going, it was the other way around, which I thought was kind of novel. And then there was a few things that she did during that time where um, she was expecting me to be, uh, she was, to be a man, right. To be an, an, an alpha more or less. And like for, I always tell this story is when we were dating, if we went out to a restaurant or a club or a concert or something like that, and we we're using her car, she would hand me the keys to her car. And mm -hmm. that to me. And so I was dry. I was expect She expected me to drive from point A to point B in her car that she had insurance on. Like I didn't have insurance on it. She just gave me the keys. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of set the tone or the frame of that, that, that sent me kind of a message that said that this is what this woman is about. And, and she was hot as fuck. So I was like, I wanted to, you know, really want to tap that ass. I'm not going to lie, but that's the sex part of all of that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, as I've said, you know, the uh, sex is the glue that keeps relationships, yeah. marriages together. You would you would not believe how many women lose their minds when I say that. And and men, too, who want to identify with them as well. But the, the, the sexual side of it is it's nice to have somebody who knows, like, what I like and what I like to yeah. do. And yeah, there's, yeah, there's yeah. Side of, so there's no, there's, I mean. There's I, no singular I, problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. You're, you're trading variety for somebody who you you can work with i guess you know like in a partnership yeah. but i don't really yeah. see the thing is when people that i've been asked this question before by the way um i don't look at marriage as a a a, a utility to solve a particular problem because i'm already solving the problems any problem that i would have had anyways right well, but the um the i look at it as a lifestyle choice so yeah. I talk to guys like uh, Justin Waller or even the Andrew Tates of the world or even Myron and them. Or I remember Kevin Samuels was, you know, a high value mm -hmm. man should cheat or he gets to cheat or you don't be surprised if he does cheat because he's a high value guy and women are going to want to get with him. I've always been kind of like uh, sussing out the the differences in how we do marriage now versus how we used to do it in the 20th century. Sure, so sure. I have, I have what would be known as a traditional marriage. It's closed on my end and it's closed on my wife's end. That's right. how we do it. Right. You don't cheat on me. I don't cheat on you. Those are the no, that's the terms of but, our, but I feel, our I reason. feel like that bond though, because I, not to mm -hmm. interrupt you, but like Kevin Sam is like one of the things that I think he was trying to say with his concept of, you know, like a, a high value male isn't going to be monogamous and it's going to mm -hmm. have sexual variety and things like that. I don't know that everyone wants sexual variety for their entire life, right? Like there's, mm. there are people who go, I think a high value male should be sexually satisfied mm. for a high well, value male to be I'll... sexually dissatisfied. So mm. if you're saying, listen, I'm married 27 years and I'm satisfied. Like mm. I'm sa that's all that matters. If you say I'm satisfied, if you say, yeah, I've been married 27 years and I've traded sexual satisfaction for the fact that, you know, I have someone who I can talk to. Like that seems strange to me for a high value man, but for a high value man to say, listen, I'm sexually satisfied. I got a person who satisfies me. And so I, that box is checked. Mm -hmm. And then to me, there's absolutely no issue with monogamy. There's absolutely no issue with saying, yeah, I'm only sleeping with one woman because this woman makes me happy. She satisfies me. She knows mm -hmm. what buttons to push and she's mm -hmm. taking the time to learn and she makes sure that they're, they're pushed with the frequency. I want them to be pushed. And you know, I don't think there's anything downside mm -hmm. on that, but I, I like the idea. And I was always interested to see if you saw it as a, as you put it, a utilitarian, Thing, I don't, you know, I, don't I don't look I look at it as a, as a lifestyle choice and then of course what I do I mean I was just for Christ's sake I was just in Vegas just like two days ago at the babes and toyland event I could have got I was gonna go to the wet Republic a bikini contest with Mike Sartain now uh, granted my 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 reign my wife knows who I am and I know who she is and so it's nice to be surrounded by beautiful women who are like you know that are kind of into you and want to talk to you and they think you're great and you got all this social proof and this pre-selection that's awesome I come back home or I go out I know my wife's going to want to you know have sex with me and really kind of say okay I know you're going so you better get in the bedroom right I'm now the guns, um, yeah yeah so um 
but so that's but that's one aspect of it. The other aspect is this is so when I look at like you were just mentioning before um, the variety versus the familiarity kind of like equation that goes on there. And I've always thought this is like I I'll, I know guys who are, um, are really good friends of mine who have a main girl. They might be married to her. They might not be married to her. But then they also have side pieces or some in some cases, the girl will bring in women. So she gets to select the women. So she says, well, you need variety. I'm going to go get this my girlfriend here. and We're going to have sure, a three way sure. with you or something like that. It's OK to fuck her, but it's not OK to fuck her. I think and, there's a lot of, of varieties of ethical non-monogamy out there. Hmm. And, and I, I think people would like to believe that all of them end up in my office. That's just hmm. not true. I, I have a lot of people who come in and they get divorced and, you know, they say, oh, yeah, we, we for, you know, 10 years of the marriage. You know, he had a girlfriend or he, you know, just had a sexual relationship with me. He always came home to me. We're getting divorced because he lied to me about all our finances and he did all these other things that had nothing to do with that stuff. Like so the sexual component of things is is not always I mean, I've even done divorces where, you know, there, there was no sexual component to the relationship because one of the two of them or both of them were gay or lesbian. Mm -hmm. And they just said, look, we're, we're partners. You know, we're we're in this mm -hmm. thing together, raise kids or to have a household together. And again, it's a legal status marriage. It's not, it comes in all shapes and sizes. There are people that marry that, you know, have dynamic sexual chemistry that last their whole lives. There's people that get married that sex isn't that important to them, I guess. And that's certainly fine. As long as you find the one that matches up to you. Mm -hmm. But again, my, my biggest issue with people is you just are signing on for something that you don't even know what yeah, you need is. to take a college course for it before you can, right. you, should, you need right. a certification before you can go propose to your wife. But so my, my point was, this is like, that when I look at like people who have open marriages where it's like open on both their ends mm. or it's, it's ostensibly it's open on that woman's end because she's still on Instagram and, you know, showing her ass off and sexual availability while he's expected to be like completely monogamous. I've, I've, I've done those shows before, but like when we mix this into marriage, like I've always been like dumbfounded by the fact that there's this guy has a main, but yet he has all kinds of sexual access with all of these side chicks that he could be with. Yeah. And I'm like, what's, why not just simply play the field why not just simply be like non-exclusive and you don't have a main you just have a bunch of girls that you're you're with all the time i think there are there are people that have that but i think that yeah. i think that i think a lot of them realize you know that that as i've said in the software belly interview you know look mm -hmm. i don't think i can learn everything i need to know about myself from myself i think i have blind spots and mm -hmm. and you know they wouldn't be a blind spot if i could see them so yeah. I need other people in my life. Do that, does that have to be a romantic partner? No, it could be friendships. It could be any mm -hmm. number of things. But for some people, having one person, this main person that, that is like your go-to person. And, and I do think there is something. Look, I, I think that building familiarity with someone can be really good. I don't know most people that say, oh, we had our best sex on our first date. Mm -hmm. I think most people say, oh, yeah, we had to kind of go around a little while and get to know everybody's equipment before we mm -hmm. had a really good time. Mm -hmm. um, I think most people would not say, oh, yeah, 20 years into the relationship was the best sex we ever had. I think most people will say, yeah, it took like six months, you know, a year before mm -hmm. we really kind of knew how to make each other's heads blow off. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there might be something to having a main person. And, and then if there is some need in you for variety, you know, that, that look, you have the right to do. Again, I think this is all very personal choice. This is all things that people, but just be honest with yourself first. You know, what you said, and you said it in, in your first, actually, I think you said it in all your books, but you know, you say it repeatedly and you just said it now. You knew yourself, you knew how to meet your own needs. You went into this thing with your eyes open, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I think because of that, you know, you, you gave off to your spouse this sense of, look, this is who this guy is. He's as advertised. You know, you didn't marry and then go, oh, by the way, I'm completely changing the script of who I am, what you should expect of me, mm -hmm. what I expect of you. I think that's just unfair when people do that. Yeah. And that's what the majority of people do when they get married. I've always I've always said this. And like when people have asked me, like, I don't do advice. I try not to anyways. I try not to do prescriptions. I try to do an anal analysis, really. But like when people ask me, well, OK, we're all what's the key to like a healthy relationship? I'm always saying, you know, it's polarity, really. It's not like familiarity. It's not if you're constantly having to work on your relationship, a, a good relationship is effortless. Right. If you're constantly having to work on it, is it like, oh, my God, always a work in progress? it's like it's like, no, no, Amen. it's it, you. the best relationships are the ones where it's just like, I know what I'm supposed to do. She knows what she's supposed to do. And that's how it works out. Dude, I had, a, I had a buddy of mine call me up a couple months ago. And he said to me, um, you know, I said, how you doing? He said, good. You know, we, we moved in, you know, my girl and I moved in together. 
And I said, oh, cool. How's it going? And he said, well, you know, you know, it's not easy. You know, those first months when you move in with somebody. I was like, mm-hmm. first months you move in with somebody, all you do is fuck it, put together Ikea furniture. What the <laughs> fuck are you talking about? It's not easy. Uh-huh. Like if you say, oh, you know, marriage is really hard work. All right, then, then you're not in the right marriage. If it's really hard work, like I don't know. I'm not saying marriage is always going to be effortless and there aren't challenges. Life is filled with challenges and, and, mm-hmm. and maybe you have someone to navigate them with if you're married or if you're in a, in a pair of bonds. But to suggest that like, you know, you just got to slug through it. You just got to, you know, that's a, mm-hmm. that is the propaganda that's been sold to us by mm-hmm. society, which is like, yeah, it sucks, but you got to, there's this Puritan work ethic, you know, that yeah. like your reward will be great in heaven if you just mm-hmm. defer gratification for your entire life and just stay with the loathsome harpy who castrated you just stay mm-hmm. with her and then there you'll get a reward in disneyland in the sky mm-hmm. like i i just don't buy it i don't think anybody should buy it that seems like it's just a, mm-hmm. it's a fairy tale a lot of, i think a lot of that has to do like it, it locks into the responsible the personal responsibility like me because that's the that's one way i think that guys because guys have that burden of performance and so when you when someone's like well, I, I've had these conversations, even like sussed them out in an essay before, but it's the difference between like uh, commitment, commitment to like yourself, commitment yeah. to your own interests versus commitment to family and commitment to something that's outside of yourself. And what is yeah. more important? So when you get into a relationship, are you going to get more gold stars and more brownie points in heaven or even here? If you stick it out with this girl or this woman and, and you, you're just, you know, you do, you're stuck to your commitment. You're a man of your word, right? But yet you're living this miserable life because you failed in your commitment to yourself. So what's more important, your commitment to yourself or your commitment to to your to your wife or something that's outside of yourself? And always like it's it becomes a very difficult conversation for people, especially when it comes to marriage. Um, let me. Uh, I want to get to the rest of these super chats here. I got one more thing though. But like when we're talking about the way we do marriage right now, I've, I've got all these people talking about like open marriages and. We were in, we were, I think I was asking this question on Access Vegas and a lot of the girls and even some of the guys there were talking about how they're in an open relationship or it's kind of like, uh, you know, open on his end, but closed on her end kind of thing, but they're married, right? There's now, now take all of that dynamic, that human dynamics there where it's like monogamy and promiscuity, right? Which by the way, both can be correct at the same time for human sure. nature, but um, the, but the problem is, is now we litigate it. Now we formalize it. Now we turn it into something that has uh, state power. Now it turns it into a contract, the unconscionable contract, right? right? Now, so how do you do that? And what rules do you instill? What laws do you create for? It's easy when it's closed on his end and closed on her end. And the the understanding is it's this traditional, you know, conservative Christian, Judeo-Christian marriage where um, the, the expectations are known of each other, but now you've got homosexual marriages. Now you've got uh, open on all of our ends and we can fuck whoever we want, except for when he goes and behind my back and fucks this bitch that I didn't want him to fuck. And now that's cheating. So what is cheating? Cheating is a breach of contract. So what's the contract? And it kind of comes back to what you were saying before. That contract has to be has to be spelled out at right. the very beginning because otherwise it's like, I know we have open marriages, but I really don't want you fucking that girl over there because she's going to baby trap you or she's going to ruin our lives because you wanted to go fuck this girl behind my back. That, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot I, of the game, you write that into a contract though. Yeah. You, you kind of don't. And I think mm-hmm. that, that, you know, look, I, I live, uh, I split my time between New York city and uh, in and, and the middle of the woods in, in upstate New York. And um, I, I happen to live in the Chelsea area. So I live in a building and in a neighborhood that's a huge gay male you know, population. And, mm-hmm. and I, so I have a lot of gay male friends. And I gotta say, one of the things you learn when you have a lot of gay male friends is that gay men are like way ahead of, of heterosexual couples when it comes to having like open concepts within the relationship and discussions about, okay, listen, you know, we can both get blowjobs, but neither of us is going to have sex with a person unless we tell them that we're going to do it. And they they have these discussions because it's men, it's two men. Mm-hmm. And they're talking about the fact that, look, uh, you know, we know we're going to want some variety. We know we're going to be out on Fire Island. We're going to see all these dudes that we think are hot. And we're going to, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to do our, so look, let's have a conversation. What are we going to do when that happens? Are we going to do this together? Are we going to do group mm-hmm. stuff? Are we going to say, okay, these are the ground rules or I, you can do it, but I got to be there. Or you can do it, but I don't want to know about it. Heterosexual couples, man, we never caught up to that. Like we never caught up to that. And I, I have mm-hmm. to believe that biologically that comes from the fact that, you know, this pregnancy mm-hmm. is, a, is a potential thing. I think there are biological hormonal pieces to this. I mean, we didn't get into that. I guess this is the stuff we'll save for 
when I come to Vegas in September. Sure. But uh, look, you know, I think there's a biology piece to this. I think, you know, it, not to quote John Gray, but like Mars on uh, fire, v, uh, Venus on ice, like that kind of concepts of, of how oxytocin works and how cortisol works and how testosterone affects things. I think all of those things, I mean, you talked about it recently about the mm. testosterone piece of things. And when women bodybuilders go on testosterone, mm. other sex drive amps up. I, I think that women don't necessarily understand in heterosexual relationships, the, the manner in which men's perception and worldview is shaped by their sexual drive. And I think that if there was an honest, if there was a capability of having that honest conversation instead of this bizarre thing we have now, where if a man looks at other women, he's a piece of shit. Whereas mm -hmm. if a woman looks at other men, oh, she's exploring and it's mm -hmm. innocent and harmless. It, I mean, would they make, how could you make the movie Magic Mike, but with strippers? Yeah. Like it's not possible where it's like charming mm -hmm. that all the men go to the strip club and it's like a charming <laughs> thing. And uh, it's like, yay for the men, they're having fun in the club. Like it wouldn't happen. It's always has to be mm -hmm. all these scumbag men who are looking at mm -hmm. all these women. And it, it, it's insane. But to then try to put the power of the state on top of that, like we mm -hmm. haven't figured this thing out enough to make it punishable by force of law. And I'm sorry mm -hmm. to be the one to spoil the party. I'm sorry to be the skunk at the picnic. But, and maybe it's, you know, I shouldn't say anything because listen, I'm making a great living just helping people facilitate the demise of unhappy marriages. But I really did try to come out with, with the things that I said in that interview in my books where I'm trying to just say to people, listen, guys, maybe we need to rethink this. Maybe we should get better at it before mm -hmm. we put the force of the state behind it. Mm -hmm. like, like everybody seemed to figure out on other things that before we make something criminal or before we make something punishable by fine or imprisonment, we should understand what it is, right? Mm -hmm. What do we mean? Like if, if I said, you get to go to jail if you speed, what does it mean to speed? Oh, I don't know, we'll figure it out. What? No, no. Well, no, we see it, yeah. <laughs> you gotta tell me like, the, well, what we'll do is we'll just look at like, what are the road conditions and what are the weather and how good are you as a driver? And then the judge will make a decision based on that. It's like, no, 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 no. I need to know the rule. It's 55, 55 is too fast. Okay, 56 is a crime, mm -hmm. 54, we're fine. Okay, got it, I can follow that. I don't know that I should have to, but I get it, I'll follow that. That's civilization, it's discontents. That's the social contract. We mm -hmm. all have to agree. We're gonna say this is the speed, even though if I'm a good driver, I could drive faster than that without hurting anybody. We're all gonna agree to be stuck with this fucking rule. But the problem with marriage is no one has talked about what it is, mm -hmm. what's a good marriage, what's cheating, what constitutes cheating. The fact mm -hmm. that, that, you know, okay, we all agree having sexual intercourse with a person who's not your spouse is cheating. Okay, is DMing with that person, is sending nudes? Uh, yeah. Of course it's yeah. cheating. Well, no, it's not cheating. Like it's a convenient thing to try to define that while we're in the middle of it, after we've already signed on, so I, I think that's the real, real. Yeah, I, I honestly, honestly, I think when when, when I've heard like people talk about like emotional affairs and stuff like that, or it's uh, there's no sex involved. It's just like there's an emotional attachment or something, and that that's considered cheating. Or like a guy like jerking off to porn, or like like your friend. I the, I think you related some story in Soft White Underbelly about the guy who just got hand jobs from the Asian massage place because oh, yeah. he wasn't getting laid at home, and he's just like, you know what? at least he was doing the responsible thing, right? It's like, I yeah. want to get, I got to do something here. And I don't want to, I don't want my kids to be involved. I don't want anything. I don't want to ruin my life, but yeah. you know, I'll still get a hand job now and then. And that's that. Which that by the way, I felt so bad for that dude. I mean, no. fucking hand, first of all, hand jobs, I said, it's like a Betamax. Like what an outdated technology, like the, the <laughs> hand jobs. Like that's the mm. saddest goddamn thing in the world, you know? And this guy made money. He was in finance. So mm. I don't understand, but I understood the thing. And she was so mad at him. I mean, she, I got her litigation papers made it sound like this guy was just a criminal and a dangerous. She actually asked that he should have to be drug tested. Oh, geez. a ten panel hair drug test. And we said, why? Did he ever seem mm. intoxicated? She said, no. But if he's engaged in that illicit behavior, how do I know he's not engaged in other illicit? What behavior? else is he into? So yeah. I went into court and I was like, well, maybe judge, maybe he's a bank robber. You know, I mean, if what we're saying is that he engaged mm. in arguably inappropriate behavior in this capacity it must mean he could have done any number of other crimes 
That's the that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Yeah. By the way, the people I, you got a bunch of people in the comments who are concerned that I'm gay, which I uh, I appreciate. No. I will say I <laughs> wish I wish I was gay. <laughs> I have my best friend. We're constantly saying to each other, if we could just be gay, our lives would be so much easier. I would have kept half my 401k 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Um, unfortunately, uh, I am not gay. Um, although, you know what, I maybe I never used to like broccoli and now I love it. So who knows? Maybe second half, I'll figure it out. And I'll go gay. I don't know. I always use this. I always use this example with and it bugs Aaron Clary when I say this, but like there's a difference between like gay marriage because it's not gay marriage. It's same sex marriage. And I was I explaining, trying to explain that because the, the terminology is just saying, how do we how do we outline this? How do we codify this? Right. Yeah. And so I'm saying, OK, so if you take same sex marriage. Theoretically, on paper, I could marry Aaron Clary, and the yeah. terms, the terms as heterosexual men, both of us yeah. heterosexual men, and here's the terms of our, the terms of our marriage is fantastic. You get, go, you get to go out and fuck random girls. I get to go out and fuck random girls, and we're gonna on paper, we're still married. We're gonna live in the same house, whatever. Like, wow, whatever you listen, want. Listen, I, I gotta how, tell you, Ma that's, that's how marriage. marriage. That's marriage mm -hmm. equality. I, I was one of the people on the front line saying that we should have marriage equality. That we should the gay people get first of all. Gay mm -hmm. people have the right to be as fucking miserable as heterosexual people. Absolutely. <laughs> they have the right. And by the way, as someone who's friends with a lot of gay men, when gay marriage passed, I said to a number of my gay friends, I'm like, hey, man, are you psyched? Do you know marriage quality? And they were like, are you fucking kidding me? They're like, this is the worst <laughs> thing that ever happened. I said, what do you mean? They're like, do you realize I never had to have the talk? I never had to say, Where's this going? Where are we getting? Mm -hmm. Are we ever getting? All I had to do was go, oh, I wish I could marry you. But the state, oh, the state, they won't <laughs> let me. God <laughs> damn, the poor, the state. And now they took that away. And now they got all mm -hmm. the same problems that heterosexual couples. And all my gay male friends were like, Jesus, now I got to have a conversation about are we getting married? And next thing's going to be we're allowed to have kids. And it's going to be when are we having kids? And they were like, he's like, this is. I was so happy to be gay that I didn't have to deal with this shit. And that's why I, I, I when, when anybody, the anybody thinks that I put off their gaydar, God bless. I wish if I could push a button and be gay tomorrow, I would be happy to be gay. But the truth mm -hmm. is, like, because there is not the level of expectation. But guess what? That's changed too now. Marriage equality brought this into a whole nother place. You could mm -hmm. follow that. Listen, if you weren't married already, I can go marry a guy and we can agree that we're going to have relationships outside. We're never going to sleep with each other. Because again, I love when people say those kinds of things because it makes you realize marriage is a legal status. It's not a relationship status, guys. It's a legal status. Yeah. So if you, if I can marry another man and we have sex with people, we have sex with women because we're heterosexual, then why are you going to say to me, oh, yes, marriage is spiritual? Because we're using the same term to describe different mm -hmm. things. What Raul is calling covenant marriage versus contractual mm -hmm. or state-based marriage. Covenant marriage, what you're talking about is a heterosexual or homosexual union between two people who are spiritually in the eyes of the community and the world and the family. That's a totally different thing. But but the legal status, yeah, anybody, get married. Get married now, and it's a legal status. You have no idea what you signed up for. There's no pamphlet. Google it, guys. There's no yes. pamphlet. What There's do no you need course. to know before yeah. you get married? Here's what happens. You don't get it. It doesn't <laughs> exist. It's not out it's there. It. And guess what? If I want to go to the wedding expo, they won't let me in. They won't let the skunk get the picnic because they're too busy trying to shove cake down your fucking throats. So go ahead, guys. Swallow the cake. I hope it tastes good. I hope this you don't is choke the on it 20 years from now. This is a conversation I wanted to have because, like, I know that there's a lot of trad cons that come after me, and they're like, oh, "How come Rolo's so down on marriage?" And the thing is, I'm not. I have a really great. I wish, I wish I could, uh, I could bless everyone with the great marriage that I have, but I can't do that because, first of all, I'm not you. Your wife, whoever, the girlfriend is not my wife. Our situations are different. Our circumstances are different. Um, you know, our, 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 maybe our belief sets are different as well, but is marriage a good thing for me? Yes, it's fantastic. And has it been the bedrock of Western civilization for hundreds and hundreds of years? Yes, absolutely. It has. I'm not against the institution and the concept of marriage. I mean, I wouldn't have paid for a bloody expensive wedding if I didn't right. believe that. But the thing well, is, the trad con guys too, usually there's a religious how, component. 
how we do it now. And this whole yeah. conversation you've been having with me right now is how we do it now. Right, so, right, it's, right. And look, I'm not trying hmm. to shit on Matt Walsh. I, I, and when I talk about- Oh, I will. Go, please be, be I mean, my guest. But, but look, like, because I, I enjoy his show, actually. I, I think hmm. that, that Tradcom people, I get it. A lot of them are, they have an underlying religious narrative. They're talking about marriage as a spiritual religious covenant. And it is mm -hmm. not for me to say, I don't listen, I don't know. And they don't know. And I guess we're not going to find out till we die. So I, you know, listen, I don't know that I believe in God. I hope I'm wrong. I don't know. But the truth is that, that, you know, that's not what most people are talking about. And in the Bible, when they're talking about marriage, they are not talking about the legal status conferred on you by the state in which you've resided for six months sure. as a resident prior to mm -hmm. your marriage. I know for a fact that is not what the <laughs> Bible was talking about. They were not talking about what do we do in Utah versus what we do in New Jersey because neither of those concepts existed at the time, gang. I hate to break that to people. I'm sure there are track on people out there that are like, Jesus was in New Jersey. Like they don't know any of that. No, so no. I, I, I get that like, you cannot claim that the Bible says anything about marriage as the state defines marriage. It doesn't, the state didn't exist at that time for God to be talking about the state. It didn't exist that way. So we're talking about two completely different concepts when mm -hmm. we're saying that, that because this is the biggest comments, you know, the, the 21,000 comments on the soft white underbelly thing. And, mm -hmm. and I didn't read all of them, but I got to tell you, I read some of them. And a lot of them were like, he ignores the fact that that this is a there's a religious covenant to marry and marriage is a religious covenant and i have muslim people who say it i have christian people who say it and jewish people who say it i'm not ignoring that guys what i'm saying is that that's not what the, the the quran is not talking about what the state of new jersey says happens when you legally marry another person that's the clay i work in guys i but what happens spiritually is over my pay grade what I do is talk about what you have to pay for and not pay for, where you're allowed to live and where you're not, whether you get thrown out of your house on an order of protection on false allegations of domestic violence or whether you get to stay in that house. That's the clay I work in. It's got nothing to do. Jesus and the prophet Muhammad don't show up for court. You know, God don't God don't run the bingo. I, I run the bingo. And that's that's what we are here to talk about. It's not talking about spiritual stuff. I, I, I'm not going to tell people that what God wants them to do or doesn't want them to do. It's out of my that's out of my hands. Yeah. Let me get to some of the rest of these here. I don't I got I'll be I will be remiss in my duties here if I didn't give you. There you go. OK. Are you happy now? Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, do you think humans, uh, real biological nature is to be serial monogamous monogamy or short-term relationships rather than lifelong pair bonding? I, I know what I will say, but yeah, I, I know what you're taking. My personal, that. I mean, listen, I think it's sort of beyond me. I mean, I don't know that what humans, I wouldn't speak for all humans. And I also don't know what's cultural versus what's biological. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really know. I, I, and I'm even my own proclivities. Even if I say to you, listen, I'm not a guy who likes to have 15 women. I like to have one partner and be focused mm -hmm. on that partner. That's me. And that I don't, I can't dissect my own heart and say to you, well, this was the influence of my mother and this was the influence of my culture and this was the influence of being raised with, you know, strictly Catholic. I can't deconstruct my own psychology that way. I don't know why I like what I like. I always say I, that, 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 that both can be true. Are we naturally monogamous? Sure. Yes. Are we naturally promiscuous? Yes. The problem is we're, the, the monogamy comes as a necessity because right. we are because of we're sexually dimorphic. And, I, and I don't know that our options. biology is to be transcended or whether it's to be embraced. I mean, we're naturally gluttonous. Does that mean that we should True. be gluttonous? We're, we're mm -hmm. naturally all kinds. We're naturally violent. Does mm -hmm. that mean we should be violent? You know, or should we channel certain drives? Like, I know I am violent. So I channel my violence into Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I channel it into to athletic competition, to, to, to working out. This is what I do with that part of myself rather than try to suppress it. Because if I try to suppress the part of me that wants to be violent, then I'm just going to be unhappy. So, so if you're satisfied, if your sexuality is satisfied by monogamy, great. If your sexuality is not satisfied by monogamy, okay, then you should figure that out. You could try to change your psychology, change your biology if that's possible, or find satisfaction, you know, in a different manner than the way that the culture is telling you. I mean, this is this is your life. You get to make those choices. But to say one size fits all, this is the problem with marriage, is it's saying one size fits all. And very rarely, if someone says, what's a good diet? For who? 
for you? Like I have friends that are very happy being vegans. I have friends that I would, I know I would do very poorly as a vegan. Like it just doesn't work for me. So there, right. and it's not flavors. It's not my body doesn't respond well to it. Not everybody responds to everything the same way. And I think sex is the same thing. Relationships, the same thing. When you come to, when you come to Vegas, we'll go to Texas day, Brazil. <laughs> there you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, James, what are your thoughts on the Steven Crowder divorce? Uh, I, I don't, I don't really, you know, I don't really opine on specific divorces. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I have my thoughts. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are on it. Oh, I did a whole show on it actually. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I didn't see, I didn't oh. see the, I didn't see the oh. show. So yeah. I, I mean, look, I think that he, I know you, you know, lesson. it was a lesson. Yeah. It was a lesson to be taught I, because he was, he was very, I mean, Okay, so she was a virgin. He was a virgin. They were both evangelical Christians before that part. I know. Yeah, he got hired at uh, I don't know if it's Fox or Breitbart yeah. or or you know yeah, somewhere, yeah, yeah. and was Breitbart. very self righteous about it. And here we are. And so, yeah. you know, look, post- I'm not surprised he's getting divorced. I thought mm-hmm. that that video that she put out there to humiliate him, um, I thought he looked ridiculous in that video. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I I was embarrassed for him, um, and I've never met him. But I have to tell you, as a divorce lawyer, like the most difficult thing probably to do as a divorce lawyer, people are like, oh, as a divorce lawyer, it must be hard. You know, you see kids going through stuff. I'm like, no, the hardest part is just watching how fucking humiliating people treat themselves. Like watching people, like watching him with the like, well, you know, I was, I was supposed to use the car today. And well, if I, you can't use the car. Well, I was going to use the car today. And I'm looking at him like, what are you fucking toddlers? I know. Like you're Todd, like so you're the the failure of democracy is that your vote equals mine. <laughs> That's what's wrong with democracy. Like like the fact that you uh-huh. and I equally get to vote is what's wrong with democracy. Like I, I and again I don't know this guy, but you know he seems like he's got a point of view. He seems like he's built an audience. He seems mm-hmm. like he's at least intelligent enough to like be funny. Like some of the shit when he takes the piss out of uh, AOC and stuff like that. I think that's Mm -hmm. hilarious. Like some of the sacred cows he goes after, he does it quite fearlessly. And I like that. Mm -hmm. I like when anybody does that on either side of the aisle. But I got to tell you, man, like it makes me sad when I see anybody who's a grown ass man or a grown ass woman just like a beggar with the cup out. Like, well, I can't use the car. Well, you were being mean to me. Like, and you're yeah. like, what are you? You're grown up. Like, fucking leave. Just get divorced. What are you doing? Why are you torturing each other? Why are you staying together? Like, you're going to die someday. Why are you going to waste your life with this person being miserable? I, I do divorces that I look at it and I'm like, what? how did you stay married? Like, the guy was getting the hand jobs for $50 or whatever. Six years they didn't have sex. Six years. Why are you married, man? Just leave. Mm-hmm. Just go. Even to take all my stuff, half my stuff, take three quarters of my stuff. I'll mm-hmm. be free. I'll live my life. I'll be happy. Like, just why would you commit? So I look at Steve Crowder and all I can think is, listen, man, what are you doing? Like, you're a grown man. You're funny. You're successful in your own ways. You burn some weird bridges. I don't completely understand your, the career moves you've made. But you know what? Like you, you certainly could do better than the ridiculous shit show that you were obviously in. So good riddance to bad rubbish. Move on. She looks miserable too. Let her move on. Maybe you find somebody. 7.3 billion people in the world, guys. You're bound yeah. to find somebody who could make you yeah. at least slightly less miserable than that person. Yeah, no. And now he's now he is Steven Crowder. So it's like, and he's got right. so he's got some name recognition. Sam Whiskey. Oh boy. Uh, what does Rolo and James think of vetting your business partner's future wife? Man, that now your head's in the right place, buddy. That is, you know what? Makes perfect sense. Here's what I'll tell you. It, this is this is gold, and I'm glad somebody thought to bring it up. Mm-hmm. That is a big thing, man. If you mm-hmm. if you business first of all, I don't have any partners. I don't have any business partners. I don't believe mm-hmm. in it. Like that is just you just I'm a much more of a lone wolf in terms of the things I do. But I gotta tell you, if you're gonna have a business partner, if you're gonna have a Steve Wozniak to your Steve Jobs, boy, meet their spouse. Meet their spouse. Find out if they got a prenup, if you can have any influence on your partner to make sure that they have a prenup. If they're getting married, if you have a business partner and they're getting married, you got to get them to get a prenup. You got to do it because I have guys who their business gets burned alive by their partner getting divorced. Right. Right. I had a guy, I had a very public, it was in the New York Post, one of the divorces I did where the wife went out and just destroyed this guy's business goodwill. Just, she was so mad at him because he was 
flying off to Miami and banging strippers in Miami. And mm-hmm. she was so mad and she took a golf club to his Ferrari and his Lamborghini and his Bentley. And then she went and you know what that you could be, he could be had enough money. He could buy new ones, but man, she went after his business partners and she went after his customers. And she said to the, you know, did you, to the partner, did you know, he stole 2 million from you. Did you know that he did that? And it, this guy's whole life got set on fire and, and, and God, I felt so bad for his business partners because his business right. partners didn't marry this psychopath. His business partners were like, dude, we just have business with this person. We don't have a choice. We don't get to tell him who to marry. So, yeah, man, if you if I would vet my partner, if possible, their spouse or potential spouse uh, before I made him my partner, I would want to know their spouse. I'd want to get into mm-hmm. to some arrangement because you know, forensic accounting, which is going through the books, can be tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if someone's going through a divorce, like you do not want someone doing a colonoscopy on your business, man, uh, because your partner is getting divorced. That is a very disruptive thing. Yeah. I was going to say, I, um, I've i worked with enough guys like this, especially in, when I was working in my previous uh, incarnation mm-hmm. in Wine and Spirits. I used to work with guys who went through like nasty divorces. And these are guys who own import-export companies and they push yeah. a lot of money around, right? Yeah. And um and they, whenever they wanted to do another project or a new brand or something like that, they had a much more difficult time getting investors or getting people like motivated to want to be a part of that because they don't know if the project that they're going to be investing in is going to end up in a divorce settlement because right. this guy, he's alpha male in every other aspect of his life, except for when he gets in, involved with a woman and he turns into this like this simpering piece of shit. Well, why did, why did Bezos' court case never see a courtroom? Why did Jeff Bezos' case never see a courtroom? Because if she had litigated that case all the way through, she could have literally taken down Amazon. She could have taken down the company because his interest in Amazon, which she was entitled to half of, if divided and given to someone else, he would have lost majority stake. He could have lost his majority ownership stake in Amazon because it would have been split with him and her. So this had the potential to completely destroy the company. It could have been subject to a takeover, essentially, because his his interest would have been diluted by 50 percent. So, of course, he settled so that he could keep the stock. And by the way, even to just create the liquidity to be able to give to her any liquidity was he had to potentially sell or dilute values of, of his individual interest because that's what he's buying. So, yeah, it can take down a divorce, an ugly, high profile divorce can take down an entire industry. It can take down a company. It can take certainly take down a household or an individual. It can take down, you know, I, I have seen divorces, ugly divorces. And again, I always tell people divorce is like a table. Mm-hmm. There's you and your spouse and your spouse's lawyer and your lawyer. And just like a table, if one leg is off, it doesn't matter how fucking straight the other three legs are, that table's falling down. So I can be the most reasonable, conciliation-minded person. You can be the most reasonable person. The other lawyer can be the most reasonable person. If you got one unreasonable person in that four-top equation, this thing's a shit show. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. All it takes is one lawyer or one litigant. And by the way, the litigant is usually the problem, not the lawyer. Because we spend, I spend more of my time trying to convince my clients to see things clearly and pragmatically mm-hmm. and to realize this ain't checkers, it's chess. And think about strategically and think about it dispassionately. This is a business transaction when you're getting divorced. Think about it that way. Cost benefit analysis, upside risk, downside risk. Think about that stuff. So I I think ultimately, like, yeah, this is a huge, huge piece of thing. This could this could it can upend any business, even the largest businesses in the world are vulnerable when it comes to things like divorce. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I got uh, how often a uh, talk to you. Thanks for the 20 bucks. How often do you find prenups get overturned in divorce? Would prenups need to be updated during a marriage to keep it viable in a divorce? So that's two separate questions, but they're both good ones. I very rarely see prenups overturned in a divorce unless it fits into one of the categories I talked about earlier, which are very limited in scope. And they're usually things that were done by lawyers. Like you call your friend Bob, who's a real estate lawyer and ask him to do your prenup. Don't do that. Call a 
dedicated matrimonial lawyer. All I do is divorce. Most of my colleagues who know what the hell we're doing, that's all we do. You wouldn't go to a foot doctor for brain surgery. Don't go to a personal injury lawyer for a divorce. Don't go to me for a DWI. I wouldn't even know the first thing about helping you. So go to someone who just does this. In terms of um, uh, you know, uh, whether or not um, these things are overturned, they're generally not overturned. But is it smart? for people to update their prenups in the marriage? Absolutely, absolutely. You don't have to do it, but it's a great thing to do. I have people who've done a prenup, then they do an addendum to the prenup a few years later, then they buy a beach house or they make some major change in their finances and they update it again. And people do that all the time. It's like estate planning, do it early, do it often. You know, you don't have one will. It's better to have a will you did 10 years ago than no will at all. But ideally, every couple of years, you go in, you update your will, you update your estate planning. Same thing with prenups. You update it from time to time, which also, by the way, makes it more binding because every time you update it, you reaffirm it and ratify the prior one. So every time you build on the strength of the original prenup, and that's mm -hmm. a great thing to do. Yeah, uh, this is actually a, follow, a good follow-up to this. Uh, can factors such as infidelity and criminality, et cetera, on the part of either party affect prenups? Um, well, if infidelity or criminality are built into the prenup, yes. So you can have what's called a fidelity clause in a prenup. I discourage people from having them, but you know, people mm -hmm. do sometimes have them. I mean, people have wacky, wacky stuff in prenups, like, and it's enforceable. Like I, there was a prenup that was enforced in the state of New York that said for every 10 pounds, the woman gained from the date of marriage <laughs> to the date of divorce that she lost 10,000 a month in alimony. Wow. And the appellate court said, this is a binding clause. Mm -hmm. I don't know why you married this guy, but it's a binding clause. <laughs> and so uh -huh. you, you're, I use that as an example to explain to people that like, yeah, you can agree to, you can contract it to some weird shit if you want to. So you can have a fidelity clause that says that if a person engages in, mm -hmm. you know, infidelity, then you got to define infidelity. You got to say how you mm -hmm. prove infidelity. So you know, like in a court of law, when we were a fault-based state to prove infidelity, you had to prove what's called inclination and opportunity. So inclination was you had to have some tangible proof of the fact that there was some romantic interest between these two people. So it might be, you know, a note, it might be flowers, a jewelry purchase, and then opportunity that they were alone in a location where they could have had sex, which is how the idea of like the PI with the camera, you know, hiding with the binoculars and the divorce lawyer sitting next to him was like, that's in our collective cu cultural memory now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean that you can put it in. I think you're buying yourself a headache because again, mm -hmm. Well, she cheated. So she said, well, I cheated because you didn't sleep with me. Well, I didn't sleep with you because you're mean to me. Well, you're mean to you because, okay, now we're just off to the fucking races. So mm -hmm. I don't think infidelity clauses are smart. Criminality clauses, um, I've seen them. It's not something that commonly does. If you say, like, if the person's incarcerated, this is what I'll get. Um, you can put that in there if you know that the person you're with is engaged in some kind of criminal enterprise where it's possible that they might end up getting incarcerated. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, again, I, is that... Is that something that like it automatically sets aside the prenup? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. There's no good spouse bonus and shitty spouse penalty. I, mm -hmm. I, people are so upset when I tell them that when they come into my office. They're like, I have 80 pages of text messages. I have proof that she cheated. I'm like, great. Nobody cares. Yeah. No one like, cares. What? They're like, Does, nobody cares. She's entitled to this much in alimony, but she fucked the entire Nick starting lineup. Yeah. She's entitled <laughs> to this much in alimony and she's entitled to 50%. I don't care if she's divorcing you because she left the cap off the toothpaste or because you slept with all the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. It's the same. The numbers are the same guys. Just math. Oh, this is good. Uh, 29 male. I have a business that is growing tremendously and I don't want my future wife to have any access to the, at that asset. If my business grows more while married to her, does she have access to that growth? Yes. So the fact that she's your future wife means that you're all set because you're going to get a prenuptial agreement, my friend. That's <laughs> what you're going to do. You're a businessman. So you're going to spend a couple of thousand dollars, like what you'd spend on bottle service on a weeknight. You're going to spend on a prenuptial <laughs> agreement and you're never going to have to meet somebody like me or you're never going to have to see someone like me on the opposite side of the courtroom taking your business apart. You know, so so you're not going to have to do that. But if you the answer to your question is in the absence of a prenup, if you had a business on the day you got married and that business increases in value, that increase in value is a product of the marriage, which means that there is an enhanced earning capacity that was created during the business or during the marriage. And now that portion of the business that is appreciated in value is subject to equitable distribution because your efforts during the marriage, what we call your marital efforts, hmm. transmuted 
that separate property into marital property. And your best case scenario becomes what we call an origination credit, which is, well, the business was worth something when it started. And guess what, guys? How many of you have proof of what your business is worth on the day you got married? Did you like go out and have an appraisal before you got married? You go, hey, we're going to have a bachelor party. And also I'm going to have a business appraisal. So I have a baseline number of the value of my business. You're not going to do that because people don't do that. So guess what? Now we're going to have a war of experts because her lawyer is going to say the business was worth nothing when you got married. When you got married, it was worth almost nothing. And our lawyer, or if I'm representing you, I'm going to say, no, 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 this business is worth just as much or very close to it when they got married. So the appreciation in value is only this much. So now not only are you going to pay the lawyers for that, you're going to pay the forensic accountants for that too. And we're going to have dueling experts. And guess who's going to get to decide how yeah. much you owe her? A judge. And guess what? Here's the old joke, and it's true. You know what you call a lawyer with a 70 IQ? Your honor. <laughs> okay. That, that, that this is not someone who said, you know, I'm so interested in justice that I think I would like to become a judge instead of making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as a private practice. Like, no, it's someone who was like, man, this lawyer thing is a pain in the ass. I want to get to work at 930, work till about 1230, have a lunch break 1230 to two, and then work from two to 430 and be able to go home. And I'd like people to like have to stand up when I come in and sit down when I tell them to sit down. I'd like to be able to kind of not have to work as crazy hard and chase clients for money and deal with stress and phone calls on the weekends. The, the, the truth is, guys, like you do not want a judge making decisions about giant things like that. So the answer to your question, man, is yes, all of those. And again, it will not be on your marriage license. I promise. If you get married and you don't have a prenup, it will not say anywhere on the marriage license by the way, disclaimer, if you have a business, your business is going to be subject to marital property. They're not, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say any of that. So a lot of people right now, today, right now, it's Sunday. Yeah, it's like the evening time here in New York. Somebody's getting married right now. And their spouse, like a little angel, gets its wings. There's like a little bell going <laughs> off where someone just created an interest in a business that existed prior to a marriage. And it's slowly vesting as it grows. And someday five or 10 years from now, I'm going to be in a courtroom taking half of it away from that person. And that is just not necessary. Because, because you are a weapon. You just, you just, but, but you can take the bullets out of me so easy with a prenup, guys. I'm the, I'm the easiest weapon to unload you ever met. Just get yeah, a prenup. Uh, 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 follow up real quick. Uh, does the same thinking apply for income increase? No, income increase is not is not a, a value like a business. A business is an asset, whereas an income stream is not. But what I will say is that an income stream that increases during the marriage does affect things like spousal support and child support. Um, also, it can be considered. There, there is it, it, most states have some version of what's called lost lifetime earning capacity, which is mm -hmm. if your income went up and your spouse's income stayed the same or went down as a function of marriage, um, that you can argue that that's one of the reasons why they should be entitled to alimony or what we call spousal support or spousal maintenance. So that there are, again, complexities to this. Like to mm -hmm. honestly, to sit down, like anybody who's getting married, I think you could solve a lot of these problems by anyone who's getting married has to have an hour consult with a divorce lawyer where we explain to you as best we can in an hour, because we've been going for what, two and a half hours. We've like touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of, of the legal effects of marriage. And we could, we could sit here with all these people that are sending these messages saying, well, what about this? And what about this? I'm betting some of those people are already married. So they're asking like, what did I already sign up for? I wonder how many people go through like their, you know, they go to the church or whatever, they go to the pastor or their, you know, their parish or whatever, that, depending, and they, they get the premarital counseling from the religious guy for, I mean, how many, and how many times do you go versus yeah. one hour with yeah. you yeah. To, to do something yeah. like that? Yeah, it's yeah. just crazy. Uh, okay, I got this. Uh, hi, James and Rolo. I've noticed a recent trend of couples living together as partners versus getting married would living together and sharing assets be considered equivalent to being married by the law uh in, or in court the general answer is no there are very few jurisdictions that have what we call common law marriage or what's called mm -hmm. palimony which is where there are marriage-like mm -hmm. rights inferred by people cohabitating or holding out as spouses and usually it's required that you hold out even the very limited jurisdictions that have it mm -hmm. you have to actually claim this person's your husband or your wife this was more of a problem 30, 40 years ago. It was also a problem maybe even 15 years ago when, when um, there was not marriage equality. Because what, what like early on, like 20 years, maybe 17, 18 years ago, 
when I would represent, there were times where we'd represent like a gay or lesbian person who was not married, but had a marriage like relationship and the courts do not recognize that. So we would try to use these obscure legal theories, like say, well, they ran their house like a business and we're dividing it like a business that's unincorporated. And we had to come up with all these weird gymnastic ways of trying to like piece together obscure laws to try to get someone from getting, you know, prevent our client from getting screwed because one person had money, the other one didn't. And the law didn't recognize the the non-married relationship like a married relationship. So I think this trend, and I'm seeing the same trend where people are saying, oh, this is my partner. Oh, this is my partner. Um, mm -hmm. I introduced my significant other as my partner. Um, and I think that's the right, you know, that's the right moniker because you're not saying, oh, it's just my girlfriend because girlfriend's like, oh, I could have met her, this, her last week. When you say, oh, it's my partner, you mean like, yeah, it's my romantic partner. This is the person who's mm -hmm. my ride or die. They're my person who I'm committed to in some fashion. And I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I also like it because it's a rejection of the concept of spouse, which, again, I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's wrong for everyone. I think that there are people that are happily married, but I think we should start asking questions about one size fits all concepts. Mm -hmm. And we should say to people, listen, we, there are different ways to have pair bonds that recognize, you know, the, the nature of male, female dynamics. Love is an economy. It yeah. is, it's, it's an economy, you know, it's an economy based on human frailty. It's an economy based on on need, it's based on biology, it's based on a whole lot of things. And I think an economy merits close consideration, it merits sure. rules, but are those rules imposed by the state or should they be imposed by the two people in the relationship? Mm -hmm. And I, I think partner to me is much more of an equal bargaining position. It's two people mm -hmm. who say, you know, what are the terms of our partnership? Mm -hmm. You know, who's gonna be Steve Jobs and who's gonna be uh, Steve Wozniak? They didn't do the same damn job, mm -hmm. they did different oh, yeah. jobs. Uh, let's put a bookmark in that because I want to come back to that later on. Sure. I, got, I want to sure. rifle through these real quick here. Uh, Tom, what did Tom Anderson say? Uh, do you notice any divorce trends over the past 15 years, such as shorter marriages, more cheating, divorce ages increasing for foreign women filing, uh, women getting less preferential treatment, et cetera? Well, those are all pretty good. So if you can leave that up, I appreciate it. So because I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to miss it otherwise. But um, I want to hit all of them. Um, definitely. I'm seeing a trend when it comes to, um, you know, passport marriages. There's a lot mm -hmm. more international marriage happening. Um, thankfully, a lot of that is accompanied by prenups. Mo most of the people mm -hmm. that I know that, you know, what we jokingly passport bros who become passport husbands. A lot of them are smart enough to say, let's have a prenup. Um, and I, I find a lot of foreign women are actually pretty comfortable signing prenups they sort of understand like all right let's let's establish what the rules are um before we engage in in the situation um and by the way that, that also goes with I've, I've seen women marrying foreign men successful american women marrying foreign men and having them sign a prenup as well to protect their retirement accounts or other things um i've definitely seen uh an increase in infidelity um, insofar as caused by social media, there's a chapter in my book called if, if we were to invent an infidelity generating machine, it would be called mm -hmm. Facebook. Um, I would change that now. That was written in 2019. I would change it now to Instagram, I would call it Instagram mm -hmm. um, for sure. You know, everybody's uh, meeting their paramour in the DMs. Um, and I think that that's just the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. Definitely. I saw a big bump after COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think the COVID lockdowns put a lot of stress and fractured on people. People said for better, for worse, they didn't say for lunch. I don't think that they planned on being stuck in a house together with the kids there and having asked tough questions about who was going to stay home while the kids were learning from home and who was going to work remotely and whose job was more important or less important and people losing their jobs um, because of, of changes that were happening in the economy because of COVID. So I think anything that puts stress on relationships like the COVID lockdowns did, um, again, people's substance use increased during during the COVID lockdowns. So I think we saw a lot of, uh, of, of instability and stress and that always kind of uh, anytime the economy, like when the subprime mortgage thing hit, uh, mm -hmm. like a bomb in what, 2007, whatever it was, a um, mm -hmm. big bump in divorce at that point. So anytime something major happens, like catastrophic happens, there's a lot of, of questioning of, um, of whether or not people made good choices. And I would also say the corollary is true when there's a huge boom in the economy. Like when the housing market was rushing up, we saw a lot of divorces too, because people had mm -hmm. money now that they could go out and cheat and party. And, you know, they mm -hmm. could say, you know what, fuck it. I can take half of this and I'll be happy. I'll be good with half. So there, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of factors. There's a lot of change at any given time. If you say to most divorce lawyers, you know, what are the trends this year? We can tell you, we can tell you what's going on in the zeitgeist of, of divorce and of relationships.
Mm, okay. Uh, let's see. Where's this one? Uh, are there more lasting unmarried relationships nowadays than there are married ones? I wouldn't meet those people. I don't have. So I don't, I don't have the stats. I don't have the stats. I, you know, it's good though. I, I don't know, but I would like to find out. Actually, that's. I'd love to find out. Just the problem with some of this stuff is I, I understand the desire to know this, mm -hmm. but I just don't know how you'd accurately study it. You know, my my undergraduate mm -hmm. degree was in psychology. My master's degree and my doctoral work was in what's called media ecology, which is the study of information environments and how technological change affects information environments and affects society. And then yeah. I went to law school and I went to law school to become a divorce lawyer. So I bring a very weird, diverse background. But in, in psychology, when I studied psychology as an undergraduate, one of the first books we read was a book called How to Lie with Statistics. And it really mm -hmm. taught you like how to use statistics in an incredibly misleading way. So anytime people spit statistics at me or, well, what do the studies say about that? I'm not saying there isn't value in empirical research, but mm -hmm. my mentor in graduate school is a guy named Neil Postman. He wrote books called Amusing Ourselves to Death, Public Discourse mm -hmm. in the Age of Television, yep. Technopoly, yep. The Disappearance of Childhood. And he has an essay called Social Science as Moral Theology that mm -hmm. I think is one of the best essays I've ever read. It was in a book of his called Conscientious Objections. And what he really talks about is that like when you claim to like psychological research is is challenged in its own way. Like if I understand like the idea of, you know, the, the Milgram prison experiments, you know, and, and, and doing, you know, the Stanford prison study. But if you'd shown, you know, if you'd had those people read like, you know, Eichmann in Jerusalem by Hannah Arden before they did that study, like it would have completely changed the outcome of the study. So like certain studies to say that like physics is, you know, the same kind of science as sociology or economics or psychology. It's foolish. Like, I, I just don't think there's things you can't study, but you can look at, you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Like, I think we can look at certain things and go, well, that's common sense. That, that of course, people have a hard time with that. Or, of course, that's a hard thing to do. I got, uh, let's see, this is pretty good. Why isn't divorce treated like a job? <laughs> uh, if you can, if you quit, you stop getting your salary and benefits and you move on. If you're wrongfully dismissed, you can apply for the severance package. Wouldn't that make things easier and better? I mean, it's an interesting model. Um, I think you'd run into some of the same problems. The, the problems are not the, the problems are what would the severance look like? You know, what I always tell people is that divorce is not it's really complicated and it's not complicated. Like people come in all, like no one ever comes to my office and says, I'd like this to be really complicated and expensive. Yeah. And I want to put your Complex, kids through college yeah. instead of my own if possible. <laughs> like people come in and they go, look, I just want to be fair. Mm -hmm. And the, their partner's saying, you know, their spouse is saying the same thing in another lawyer's office. The problem is they have very differing definitions of what's fair. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, if you do a good job as a spouse, if you're the earner, if you're the provider, you know, your partner may not even know what the hell you have or what the hell you make. Like I, I was always very proud of being a good provider. So, so I was always like, no, no, don't worry about it. I got it. I've taken care of it. I'll always make sure we have what we need. Well, if you're divorcing that person, that person might be like, look, I don't even know what we have. I have so many clients who come in and they go, I don't know what we have. I don't know what liens are against it. I have clients who come in and say, oh yeah, we're loaded. And then I look at it and I'm like, you are leveraged to the hilt. You have a lot of nice stuff that the bank owns. Like you have a Ferrari that Ferrari leasing owns. You have a Lamborghini that's owned by an auto finance company. You have a house that's 90% leverage. You're fucking broke. Like, you know, you're going to get half of the equity in like very little. So you've had a great lifestyle, but it's a house of cards, you know? So I, I people sometimes have no idea what's actually there. So yeah, it'd be great if there's different models of doing it. Like we'd say, oh, if you get married, you're married this many years, you get this much money. But it's, it's the same problem as like tax. You know, why don't we have a flat tax? Or why don't we have this kind of tax? Because there's no easy solution to a complicated problem. Like if there was a simple solution, we would have probably found it or agreed to it. There isn't a simple solution. It's a multivariate equation. And it's, it's not hard to choose between the right way and the wrong way. The hard thing is choosing the righter way of two wrong ways or right. a thousand yeah. wrong yeah. ways. Yeah. All, what I've always said is like the decisions between right and wrong are very, very easy. The decisions between right, right and right or wrong and wrong, that's where we fuck everything right. up. So. Right. And uh, our, our, our divorce system is the worst one out there except for all the other ones. 
You yeah. know, like all the other ones, like there's no country that's got like, oh, we've got a great one. It's like democracy. Like, yeah, there's all kinds of problems with demo- with elective representative democracy. There's all kinds of problems with it. And it's the worst way to do it, except for all the other ones. All the other ones have other serious problems. Capitalism, there's lots of problems with capitalism. But the alternatives to capitalism leave a trail of blood most of the time. So, <laughs> you know, you, it's the same thing with this. Our, our divorce system, yeah, it's flawed. It's got all kinds of problems. I, I, I Believe me, I know them better than anybody. I bump into them all day long and I have to explain to people and apologize for them on behalf of the system all day long. But that does not mean that that's the wrong way to do it. It just might mm. mean that this is the best compromise. Mm. If no fault divorce doesn't incentivize women to file, why did it increase after states adopted those laws? Doesn't no fault make it un- an unconscionable contract? Um, no, because the question, I mean, it's a complicated question to answer. That might be a better one to say for our next conversation, because I, I think that the, the, the problem with the analysis of no fault divorce is it, it, it mistakenly thinks that creating a system where a judge has to decide if you deserve a divorce some way would influence what you get in the divorce. Mm-hmm. And what you get in the, because what you're talking about is you're saying I would, it would solve for if someone's a bad person in the marriage, they wouldn't be able to get a divorce, which doesn't actually solve the problem of having a bad person that you're married to. It just creates a different problem. Like, so mm-hmm. I, I, I don't, anybody who's talking about how no fault divorce is the reason why we have problems with marriage has cause and effect completely backwards and doesn't understand those concepts at all. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm under the impression that no fault divorce was really instituted to expedite the divorce process as yes. a result of, you know, women yes. filing for it in yes. droves back in the sixties. It was um, to take away, it was to take away an unnecessary complication in the process of getting divorced period. Mm-hmm. Uh, would James agree that family, perjury court doesn't uh, uh, follow standard judicial procedures. And how does a guy that that women can lie with impunity? Well, my man had a hard time, huh? Yeah. Uh, he got his, <laughs> he went through the, he yeah, went through he, the, I can read through the lines on that one, buddy. Yeah. Now, aren't you? <laughs> Shit. I can think about 10 guys. I know that might be. Um, so yeah, look, uh, I won't lie that the standards of evidence in, in family court are different than they mm-hmm. are in other courts. Um, the quality of, um, of, of trial work and the quality of even sometimes the attorneys and the judiciary that are assigned to matrimonial work um, and family court is lower. Like a lot of judges I know, once they get seniority, they go, yep, no more matrimonials for me, thanks. Give those to the new judges. Um, yeah. And it's not, you know, as soon as they can leave the matrimonial part or family court, they do. And they move up to one of the other courts. Um, so they don't have to deal with the broken hearts and they don't have to deal with all that chaos and the unsolvable problems of kind of doing the impossible for the ungrateful. Mm. So I get it. Um, in terms of people lying with impunity, whether it's women lying with impunity, men lying with people lie, people lie all the time. They lie under oath. I can't believe I still have to explain that to adults. Like people come into my office and they're like, well, you know, I, I did this and I go, OK, do you have proof of that? No, no. But I'll testify to it. I'm like, right. And they'll testify to the opposite. Like, well, that would be a lie. And I'm like, oh, they might lie under oath. I can't believe it. You know, like, what? oh, no, not that. You know, like, come on, guys. Like, really? Like, are we five? You know, like, yeah, people lie under oath all the time. Like, it doesn't matter what I know. It matters what I can prove. That's so, true. you know, how do you get around that? Yeah. Proof. Be psychotic about it. Video things. Have your ring cam on. Have your Nest mm-hmm. cam on all the damn time. Yeah. You know, like like you can document, protect yourself document. as best you can. Document the hell out of things. Have people sign NDAs. Have people sign things. Like it's, you know, yeah, you gotta you gotta protect yourself. Should you walk around every day with a bulletproof vest on? I don't know. How dangerous is the neighborhood you live in? You know, like when you're married, person's got a lot of leverage over you. You know, you're living with somebody like they got some leverage over you. Be careful. Be careful out there, guys. It's not easy. And, and yeah, you're stepping into a, a presumption of guilt in some ways. You know, if you call someone calls the cops right now and says, you know, he beat me up or he yelled at me or he threatened to kill me. Prove you didn't threaten to kill somebody like that's hard to prove a negative. It's hard to prove a negative. And, and cops are human. 
So two dudes in a uniform show up and a pretty girl crying says, oh, he threatened me. They're going to say to you, hey, you know what? Why don't you go home? Why don't you go to a hotel for the night, buddy? Why don't you step out? Let her have the place. And then the next day, I'm going to go in and get her an order of exclusive possession occupancy of that house. You're going to be bounced out. I'm going to get her de facto custody of the kids. And you're going to be starting from like the bottom of a ditch instead of even ground. And there are lawyers less, less ethical than myself who will tell people, yeah, make false allegations and get them thrown out of the house. Like it, it happens. So be really, really careful. You know, yeah. otherwise, don't live with someone. You don't have to. You don't have to marry someone <laughs> to have sex with them. You don't have to live with some to have sex with them. You don't have to have marry someone to have a relationship with them. Like I do, I don't think anyone needs to spell this out for if you're watching this channel, you've probably figured that out by now that you do not have to sign on for the legal contract of marriage. You don't have to move in with someone in order to have a relationship or to have sex with them. So, you know, again, to then say, how can I do that dangerous thing and have it not be dangerous? I don't know. I don't know. How do I juggle? How do I juggle flaming bowling balls and not risk getting burned? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If you figure it out, let's let find out. Yeah, let's try it. Let's try it. Uh, uh, Glenn Lawrence, uh, has James ever had a male client that came to him wanting a divorce from a woman who meets his sexual desires and satisfaction? I, I know the point you're trying to make with this, but unfortunately, the, but the answer, the surprising answer is yes, I have. Mm. I've, I've had guys who come and say, yeah, sex is fire. Sex is fire, but she's, it's rare. It's oh, rare. God. Not like I would say 99% <laughs> too of the too much, time, man. I got to get divorced. 99. No, I've never had somebody who said it's so good. I got to get divorced. Like I can't get no. any work done. Like I, that would be an amazing problem to have, you know? Uh, crazy, no, no. I, but I have had people where, you know, cause it's so common for men to come in and say, yeah, the sex is awful or like, I'm not satisfied. And that's why or they're I'm cheating or that's why. Marriages, yeah. But I, yeah, sexist marriage is much more common, but I, I, um, I've had people who, you know, like they say, oh yeah, like the sex is great. Like we have mm -hmm. great sex, but everything else sucks. Like we don't trust each other. Mm -hmm. She's irresponsible with money. She's not a great mom. We have borderline totally personality values. disorder. Yeah. yeah, like right, right. Like we have all these other. I mean, listen, you know, everybody knows there are people who are not well adjusted and really good in bed. Sometimes actually, that you know, the hot crazy ratio is mm -hmm. is you know, it's a thing. So. Um, I think that, that that sometimes people go, yeah, the sex is really good, but um, everything else sucks. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that happens. I, I, again, I don't see it often. It's a lot more often that people are unsatisfied sexually and therefore they end up in my office. Oh, well. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. I'm gentlemen. Hey, Rolo. Hey, uh, James. Uh, question for James. How prevalent are the phony domestic violence allegations and what can men do to mitigate this? Yeah, so I think you um, just talked a, about that a minute ago. Yeah, I mean, look, it's hard to say what's a phony DV allegation um, because you know most people don't physically abuse their spouse or engage in coercive control and intimate partner abuse with other people in the room. Like I'm in the middle of, of prosecuting or, or, or you know dealing with a, a heavy domestic violence case in Queens. Um, I just was on it for two days last week. It's like days six and seven we're on right now where um, this guy clearly badly abused my client. Um, mm -hmm. And he's the most charming guy you ever met. I have to tell you, he's so, he's lovely. I, I've, I've spent a bunch of days with this guy in the hallway. I can't help but like him. And I know the vicious, awful shit he's done. I've seen photos. Like I know this guy did it. Um, he's a charming sociopath. So mm -hmm. like, you know, people don't often have a sign on them that say, yeah, I'm crazy or yeah, I'm violent. Um, so, you know, false allegations of DV, it's really hard to say what's a false. There are a lot of false allegations at DV. Most of the time, I know that I'm dealing with a client who's lying to me about their allegations of domestic mm -hmm. violence when they come in and say, I'm a victim of domestic violence. Um, when someone <laughs> says that, yeah, when they come in and they say he's a narcissist and he also has borderline personality disorder and narcissistic personality disorder and he gaslights me and they throw all these buzzwords that they've got out that they walk out from mm -hmm. Oprah's book club. And then they say to me, um, yes, and I'm a victim of domestic violence. And I go, okay, did he beat you? Did he hit you? Well, no, he was very, he's very verbally abusive and emotionally abusive and he gaslights me. And that's not, in my experience, representing hundreds of victims of domestic violence. That's not what actual victims of domestic violence sound like. Actual victims of domestic violence come in and they say, in my experience, um, I want to get a divorce and I want to get divorced as soon as I can. And mm -hmm. I, I, I just want to, whatever I have to do, let's just get it done. 
And I said, well, you're entitled to this, this, and this. And they go, no, no, I, I don't need all that. Um, it's Mouth, fine. Yeah. I, I just want, it's fine. I just want them to be able to leave. I don't want them to get upset. And I just want to move on. And I just this. And, and I go, well, tell me about your situation. And they, well, you know, he's very odd. He gets upset really easily. He has a temper. And I go, well, when you say he has a temper, like, what does that look like? Well, he, he you know, he gets really upset really fast. And I said, well, when he gets upset, what does that look like? Well, he, he yells and it's even, you know, sometimes it, it gets physical. And I go, well, when we say it gets physical, what do you mean by that? Well, he, you know, uh, sometimes he'll throw things or one time he shattered my nose and one time he, and you just sit there and go, holy shit. This person doesn't even identify themselves as a victim of domestic violence. Like they don't even see it. They don't even know it. Like they don't really, they kind of go like, oh no, no. But like victims of domestic violence are like cowering in a corner. Like he just gets really upset because I'm really like, I really upset him. So for me, the surest sign that someone is, is full of it is when they come in and go, I'm a victim of domestic violence. Because mm -hmm. in my experience, real victims of domestic violence are just like, they're almost shell shocked. Like they often have substance use issues. They have what they look crazy. Like when you talk to them, they seem hysterionic, but really it's like complex PTSD. Um, and it's really, I mean, it's been humbling for me. That's the most humbling thing about being a divorce lawyer is there are times where I've been like, oh, this chick is nuts, man. Mm -hmm. And then I realized when I dig into the history that no, this person's a victim. Like this person has been victimized by an awful human being. You know, I, I'm, in, I'm in the middle of a case right now where, you know, thank God for a ring cam because I, I, I mm. caught on a ring cam was this guy beating the shit out of an eight month old puppy. And just be, and I had to watch I'll that shit. I'll go I had, oh no, 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 oh no, 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 you'd have to get past me first. I, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually, I weaponized that in that case. Mm. And I actually said, I, I went in because the court officers were all, you know, the security guards in the courthouse are all like, you know, pet people. And I mm -hmm. said to the guys, I'm like, yeah, listen, if anything happens to him in the bathroom, he attacked me first. And they're like, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We know. No problem. You know, like, know. I was, I, <laughs> oh, they were like, no problem. And the truth is, is that I just weaponized it. And it was the I didn't have any proof of him beating her, but I had proof of him beating an eight month old puppy. Mm -hmm. And that was enough to just destroy this guy. Like I took this right. guy apart like you wouldn't believe because I had that evidence, I had that proof. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what I would say is if, if your question is how do I avoid false allegations of domestic violence, it's hard, it's really hard, you know? It, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to prove you didn't do something that people only do behind closed doors when there's not company over. Mm -hmm. So I would, and saying, oh, well, I have lots of people that'll tell you how nice I am, okay. Like pictures of us happy. There's pictures of Jeffrey Dahmer smiling with people he ate yeah. later. Very happy. So it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> that some of you had photos where you looked happy. Mm. Uh, I, this is a follow up. This is a good one here, too. Uh, what is the best way to deal with false domestic violence accusations that ostensibly will never cease from a bitter ex with whom one has a child? That's hard, man. That's hard. Um, when you have a kid with somebody, it's really hard. Like you, you, you're locked in with that person. Like you, you're good. That person for 18 years, even 21 years, that person can, can torture you in a unique way. Like it is, um, I, I wish that there was a simple answer to that. I don't think mm -hmm. there is, um, be very careful about who you have kids with. I, I hate to say that, like mm -hmm. the choice to have children with someone, listen, you get divorced. All they can really do is take your stuff, you know, and you can always make more money. Like, I, I don't mean to be glib about that, but it's just money, you know, and, and money offers real solutions to imaginary problems and imaginary solutions to real problems. So I, I, I think money is a good thing to have. I've, I've been poor and then I've had money and have money's better. Um, mm -hmm. But I got to tell you, when you have a kid with somebody, God, they have leverage over you. It's unbelievable yeah. the leverage they have mm -hmm. over you because you, most people love their kids, you know, more than anything. It's like the most profound kind of love they've ever experienced. And you know, um, when you have a co-parent who hates you pathologically, I have seen people use children to just torture someone for, I would say for 18 years, but even past that, even past that, it's a lifetime. Yeah. 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 You're going to have, clear. you're going to have grandkids with that person. Mm -hmm. you know? I got, I got a, I, got, I get this all the time. And somebody will ask me questions like similar to this and they'll say, you know, it's like, oh, I only got to pay for 18 years. Well, I go, no, no, it's no. for the rest of your life. No, the rest of your as life. long as that kid is alive, that. Yeah. The the mother or the father that you have yeah. to deal with, they're yeah. always in the picture. And it when is, 30, it is always in the picture. When they're 50, amen. always in the picture. Amen. It's so true. And it's so unfortunate because I have to tell you, those are the hardest cases I see is cases mm -hmm. where there's been severe parental alienation. 
where you have someone who wanted to be a good parent and this mm -hmm. other person. Because here's what I'll tell you. Most people aren't the kind of crazy that are going to say to a kid, your dad's an asshole, mm -hmm. right? They're not going to say that. And the kid, if they're asked, hey, did mom ever say something bad about dad? If mom said, hey, your dad's an asshole, the kid would say it honestly to the people who interview them. But watch this. Ready? Hello? Here, it's your dad. <laughs> I just said your dad's an asshole. I didn't have to say it out loud. Mm. I just said it with the roll of my eyes. And yep. so look at this one. Constant. Mm -hmm. How was your weekend at dad? Did you have a good time? What'd you guys do? Oh, you went to the park? Oh, that's nice. Good. What'd you guys do? Did you see anybody there? Oh, that's fun. Yeah, tonight. All right, go upstairs. We're going to have dinner in a little bit. Versus. Hey, buddy, I'm so glad you're home from dad's. You okay? Are you okay? Yeah. Did you have it? I know I missed you so much when you were away. And, <laughs> and, and, oh, and Scraps was so sad when you weren't here. He was crying. And he's so glad you're home. I'm so glad you're home. What did you do? You went to the park today? You went to the park? It's so, oh my gosh, it's so rainy. Did you have a coat? Dad had you at the park with no coat on? Oh my <laughs> gosh. I'm sorry, Dad did that. Oh my gosh. Boy, I hope you don't get sick. I, I don't know why that happened. It's so bad out today. And were there over at the, the park over there where there's bees? <laughs> He took me to that park. Oh, I don't know why daddy did. I'm so sorry that he did that. Well, you know, go upstairs. By the way, guys, did, did she say dad's an asshole? Did she say that out loud? No. But did she, what did the message that kid got? That kid heard her loud and clear. Dad's dangerous. Dad's yeah. bad. Oh, I should, mom misses me. I should be home with her. Like, come on, gang. Like this Scraps. is, this is, and that's the <laughs> weapon. That's the weapon. They took your kid and twist them like that. And then how do you prove it? How do you prove that somebody rolled their eyes when dad called it? You can't, you can't prove it. So this is what I'm saying. The solution to this problem, it's like war games. The way to win is not to play. Don't just go get married or have kids with some random fucking person who you've decided is your soulmate because you happen to meet them in the town you both live in. There's 7.3 billion people in the world. Like you, there. Trust me. If you really want to do this, do it really carefully. Don't just get caught up in how exciting the whole thing is and just go do it like it was nothing. Or if you do, then don't complain about it and say it's my fault mm -hmm. when you need me to help bail you out of an impossible situation. When I say bail you out, bail you out as best as anybody can, which is not very well. Yep. I was gonna say the other thing is I, I've been personally trying to help a person who uh, is in another country uh, deal with exactly this alien. It's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, um, man. I've had friends um, go through it, and I have to tell you, it's it's. I can't. I should give you a. Hi I should give you a hypothetical at the end of this. Uh, what's the best way to deal with? Okay, that was weird. You got to that one. Hold on. Uh, oh, what's the title of your books? Your book books. <laughs> Yeah, I have two books. Um, one, the first one is called "If You're in My Office, It's Already Too Late: A Divorce Lawyer's mm -hmm. Guide to Staying Together," and the other one is called "How to Stay in Love: uh, mm -hmm. Practical Wisdom from an Unlikely Source." They're both relationship advice books for for what it's worth. They're basically mm -hmm. um, what you can learn as a divorce from a divorce lawyer mm -hmm. about the things that make marriages fall apart. Um, they're not really just about like how to keep. The wheels on the marriage they're also about how to be careful in selecting your spouse and things like that um that's a lot of what i do a lot of what i do now too is is i do a lot of media stuff i do a lot of i'm on access hollywood a lot so you can hear my perspectives on there and um, i'm working on my next book um so you know there's, there's a lot of me out there if you go on my my website is nycdivorces.com Mm -hmm. NYC, like New York City, divorces okay. plural. So nycdivorces.com. There's a lot of info on there. There's a media I'll drop section. That in the, I'll drop that in the description. I appreciate it. Cool. I appreciate it. But mostly oh, yeah. what I do is, listen, I love my job. I love what I do for a living. As much as I complain about the short-sightedness of people, I love what I do. I have no plans to retire as a, as a mm -hmm. lawyer. Um, I love it. Uh, but I, I, I'm very fascinated by this stuff. I'm very fascinated mm -hmm. by gender dynamics. I'm fascinated by... Our, our compulsion towards the relationship of marriage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm always going to be interested in doing these kinds of conversations. And I'm absolutely thrilled I get to do one with you, Rella, because like I said, I've been a tremendous fan for a long time. So I'm, I'm really cool, glad cool, to be cool. here. Yeah. And, and you'll be on Access Vegas pretty soon. Can't wait. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, Wes says, uh, is common law still a thing? Does it's, living with somebody for years mean court separation is required? It depends on the state you live in, but very few states recognize common law marriage anymore, and most of them have a more complex component than that. 
Okay. Uh, what, uh, in your experience, uh, is using trusts good for protecting yourself in marriage? It's the same thing that I said uh, to the other question about LLCs yeah. or about yeah. uh, revocable trusts. Um, yeah, there's lots of mechanisms you can have. The best one's going to be a prenup. Like I said, you can have suspenders and a belt, and that'll ensure that your pants stay up. But to, mm -hmm. it's better to have both. It's better to have multiple layers of protection. But the best first layer of protection is going to be a prenuptial agreement for sure. It, otherwise, not getting married. Not getting married is certainly the best protection. It is Not getting married is 100% effective in not getting divorced. But if mm -hmm. you're going to get married, getting married with a prenuptial agreement is absolutely the smartest thing that you can do, without question. Cool, cool. Uh, Glenn Lawrence, uh, again, what did you got here? Uh, why are marriage contracts not enforced like any other breach of contract? If I cancel my phone contract before the term agreement, I have to pay a penalty. So why do we reward people for exiting a marriage contract? Well, it's a question of why are you exiting the contract, right? So if the contract, like a phone contract says, if our phone service stops working and you can't place calls anymore, that you get to cancel your phone service, right? Marriage contract doesn't say that. So if, if I stop having sex with you, can you cancel the marriage contract? Who canceled it? Did you cancel it or did I cancel it? Did I cancel it by not having sex with you? Or did you cancel it by filing for a divorce from me? And if I'm not having sex with you because you're not nice to me or because you had sex with someone outside the marriage and now I don't want to condone that by having sex with you, then who terminated the marriage contract? You or the person who cheated? Like it's it's just complicated. It's, it's not as simple um, and it's not as clear in terms of the terms. Yeah. Uh, I got, uh, sorry, Chris Davidson. I didn't get to your first one. I'll get, I'll, I'll jump, I'll jump you right here. Uh, where'd it go? Uh, my friend is getting married next month. He wants a covenant marriage, but is struggling to honor the Bible Christian by following the law of the land. Currently he is getting married via the state. Okay. I don't see how okay. that is a question, but, um, as far what, what advice would you give this guy? I mean, look, I think, again, uh, whether you have a covenant marriage or whether you get married under the laws of the state, um, you, you know, a prenuptial agreement, if you're going to get married under the laws of the state is absolutely essential. I don't think it's a bad idea to have one if you're going to covenant married either. It's just a contract between two people that governs the terms of the relationship. I don't think that any relationship, whether it's a business partnership, whether it, any transaction, nobody should be afraid to to have a contract between the two people mm -hmm. anytime somebody says you don't need a lawyer for this you definitely need a lawyer for this anybody mm -hmm. time says don't bother reading the contract definitely read, read that the contract, contract. Yes. yeah so if somebody says to you like oh we don't need a contract yeah you know well maybe we don't need a contract but i'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it call me crazy call me paranoid you know i just like to do it. blame it on me my friend jim told me that you know i agree i trust you completely my friend jim said i have to do this so i'm going to do it like whatever you have to do just, just it's it's better to, to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it. Uh, Glenn, well, God damn it, Glenn. Uh, I got to I got to wrap up soon. We got. The I know. Just, uh, these, this is it. Don't, I, I, thank I'm you for it. Chance, hey, man. listen, man. I'm sending you my bill. I'm seven fifty yeah, an hour. Say, so it's billable uh, hours. For yeah, you. it's all billable time yeah, here. Yeah, billable. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a pleasure, man. Listen, I got to save something for when I come out to Vegas. So yeah, I was gonna say, Dr. Eric Nelson states in his book, "The Judicial War on Men," that 37 percent of false allegations happen in family law cases to gain or maintain child support. Do you find these figures correct how in god's name would someone come to that how would you prove that statistic like how would you how would you say 37 percent with any great quantity i mean I, even if you said at the conclusion of a trial this percentage of allegations are are proven to not be are, are found not to be proven by a preponderance of the evidence that could be that it was a shitty lawyer that could be that that those are the cases that just didn't settle and that the ones that were actual domestic violence things did settle. Like there's no way any researcher or lawyer could or agency could ever claim to have accurate statistics on that. What I will say to you is what any divorce lawyer is being honest would say, which is there are serious incidents of domestic violence happening all over the United States right now. And there are people right now weaponizing false allegations of domestic violence in child custody cases and financial cases all over the United States right now. That is a fact. That is a fact. There are good police officers protecting people right now, and there are bad police officers abusing their authority and harming people right now. This is how it works, guys. Like, these are just people. They're systems created by people, and they're painfully flawed, and they're incredible. And the only way, again, Marriage, you don't have, 
you have to live with law enforcement. You have to live with the flaws of our economy unless you live off the grid, which creates all other problems. You mm. don't have to get married. You don't have to. This is one of those things that you don't have to have this set of problems if you don't want to. Too- yes, <laughs> you might have a different set of problems. And that is that you might have a romantic partner who really like to do something that you don't want to do. And I'm sorry that you might have that problem. But guess what? That doesn't seem to me as big of a problem as some of the problems that are potentially at <laughs> risk result. <laughs> to happen when you get divorced. And you exactly. won't need someone like me for it. Uh, I got uh, this is uh, last two here. All right. Came in late. Came in late. Sorry if you answered this already. How many divorces are from just getting married because you got knocked up? Are you not? That's a great question. Up? It's really hard to see a percentage on that. Um, but I don't. I actually don't think there's. I don't think that's a frequent thing anymore that people get married just because someone Shut had a, a just someone got married. Yeah, I don't see because that was much more tied to an underlying religious narrative. But I mm-hmm. do tell anecdotally the story of, of a good friend of mine who knocked up a girl on the first date. He didn't even know this girl. He knocked her up on the first date and he was like, I'm marrying her. And I said, are you fucking, what is it, 1950? Are we in like a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical? Like, no, <laughs> like you're not married. That's no. crazy. You don't even know this girl. You went on one date with her and you knocked her up. What are you talking about? It wasn't even a second date. The second date was like four months later, her calling you and telling you she's pregnant. They've been married 27 years. They got three kids. They're like very happy. So I don't fucking know. You know, like, I, I don't know. I mean, listen, sometimes bad beginnings lead to the happy endings. Sometimes Good. great beginnings lead to, I have no idea. I don't think this is something that happens as often that people yeah. look where there's birth control, there's widespread use of, of, of abortion. I mean, there's, you know, I just don't think this is something that happens as often. Anymore. I know. I love, I love it when I get this too. Cause like when people say, Oh, Rolo, where do I find high quality women at? Where are they at? How did you meet your wife? Um, in a club <laughs> after a gig. Right. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's right. how that's pretty much how it worked. Right. You know, it wasn't oh, please. I have people, I have people that if they're honest, they're like, where'd you meet this person? Oh, I was married and we had an affair, you know, mm-hmm. and I'm at, like, I have clients oh, who are blissfully yeah. happy that were like a, an affair went right or wrong. Like yeah. I, people, you know, listen, people bad bad beginnings sometimes lead to very happy endings and ideal perfect beginnings sometimes lead to, you know, complete yeah. train wrecks. And who the hell knows? You know, there's no, I don't think there's a formula. I, I, people ask me all the time, is there a formula? Older, younger, same religion, different religions, you know, cohabitated before, cohabitated after, you know, older man, younger woman, younger woman, older man, better, both equally good looking, both equally bad looking, one better looking than the other. I, I do not see a formula. I'm looking very carefully. I don't see one, and I don't see how you'd actually be able to track it. So, yeah. Ah, oh, PPE. Sorry, I don't have your sound drop, but I'll give you this. There you go. Thank, uh, thank you for always a pleasure, Rolo. You are welcome. This has been a really great show. Last one, because this is, I saved this for the last one. It wasn't even All right. All right. All right. What's your exact advice for your sons in regard to future marriage if they want kids? What is the best route if they want kids and not to get creamed by the state? Oh, we'll end man. with this one. This is the last one. What do you tell your kids? You, you ended with a hot one, boy. I know. Um, you know, it's tricky, man. You know, because the advice, look, I'm still human. I, I want my, I want to believe in fairy tales. I want to believe there's a part of me like I have two sons. They're both in serious relationships. One of them is starting to talk about marriage. The older one, he's a lawyer, too. Um you know, it's like your daughter, man. Like I, mm-hmm. you know, I said it in this off white underbelly interview. There's a poem by Joseph Brodsky. It's one of my favorite poems. It's a poem called um, a song. And one of the lines is, I wish I knew no astronomy when the stars appear, mm-hmm. because I think that there's something so beautiful and magical about the little pinholes of light in the sky. And then you take astronomy and you learn it's like dying balls of gas, you know, and it kind of mm-hmm. takes away some of the romance of it. Like, I want my sons to have joy in their lives. I want them to feel love. I want them to experience all the beautiful things that come with relationships and with love and sex and all those things. That's what I want for them. It's what I'd always want for them. I, I, I think that some of the greatest experiences in my life came from romantic pairings and sex and affection and love and compassion. Like, it's great stuff, man. I want that for them. Mm-hmm. I would definitely want them to have prenups if they got married. Um, I'd want them to choose really carefully. Um, I'm very lucky. My, my older son, his girlfriend, I've got to spend some time with her mm-hmm. and uh, she seems to really like him for who he is. She seems to know him like she seems to get him in warts and all like the good parts and the bad parts. I they, they moved in together fairly recently and I helped 
her, I helped with the move because they live in the city and they need to get from one building to another. And he doesn't have a car. He lives in the city. So I said, oh, I'll help you, you know, and I was helping to move stuff. And I ended up riding with her and the cat because he waited at the apartment and, and then I was just driving with her. We got in this discussion about my son and like it became obvious to me that she gets like the parts of him that are like, oh, you know, like he's got mm. some of the worst of me and some of the best of me. He's got some of the worst of his mom and some of the best of his mom. And that's a real fun thing to learn how to navigate, like the things you didn't like about your ex-wife, but in your kid, mm. you know, and who you can't divorce and who you have to live with and deal with in some ways. So um, that was a lesson for me as a human being. But I got to tell you, man, like I, I hope it works. I hope that it goes well. Um, I, I think it's all about choosing wisely. So I've really tried to encourage my sons to approach relationships the way that I have, which is you shouldn't need it. You know, you shouldn't need someone to make your life complete. You should find a way to, to, to make your life complete on your own. But man, it's, it's lovely to find connection with somebody. And, you know, listen, I, I hope they, uh, you know, I don't think you win the lottery. The chances of winning the lottery are low, but you play and I hope you win. And I hope my sons win. Um, I would not say to them that they're idiots for getting married. If they don't have a prenup, they can fucking kiss goodbye any money I'd ever give to them because mm -hmm. I'm not giving any money that's going to be cut in half and given to somebody else. But yeah, look, I mean, what we want for our children, you know, is for them to move the ball a little further than we did. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's true for every father. So I, mm -hmm. I hope my, I have a very close relationship with both my sons and I'm, I'm very happy that they share with me honestly about their relationships and I try to give them the best advice I can as a father and as a man. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. I, you know, I'll tell you something. I, I, I was asked what I said to my daughter before she got married and I've already yeah. done a show on that, but I, I don't yeah, think I've ever, I, saw it. I don't think I've ever explained the, uh, the conversation I had with my now son-in-law at the time when he asked me, can I marry your daughter? Like he actually came up and, you know, and now it's cool. I, I respect him, that because I said, yeah, I, and I respect that too. And I said, uh, of course, she's asking Rolla Tomasi here. So you got about a you got about a ninety minute, uh, you know, uh, dissertation. Tuck in, yeah, tuck, tuck in. in. <laughs> so, but I, I asked him. I said, do you know why young men ask the fathers for their hand in marriage? And it's not because it's property. It's not because it's you know. It's not because women are just cattle or shit like that. I said, it's because you're not just asking to marry my daughter. You're asking me to blend my tribe with your tribe. Right. And it's that's like if you look at like a, I mean if you look at a movie like Braveheart, it's easy. Like William Wallace when he's when they want to elope, but he feels bad about it because you know he it's it's dishonoring him as a man. And the reason why he felt bad about like not uh, you know asking the father, which eventually he does, right? But right. The, the it's it's not necessarily a formality. It's it's a necessity because I don't think enough people really realize that when a couple gets married. And you see the you see the nasty end, end side of this, but when a couple gets married, they are also blending families. They're also and I mean, even if there's no children, right? They're just gonna have kids later on. So the the the, the consequences and the results and everything, the, you know, the the downstream effects, the ripples in the water that happen as a result of two people coming together, it's not just about those two people. It's yeah. also about mom and dad and his mom and dad and That's grandma that. and grandpa and uncles and every and everything and Children, grandchildren, great grandchildren yeah. are affected yeah. by that one thing. So what it's what it really is is it's a formalization of saying it's not just can I have your ha daughter's hand in marriage, it's I want to blend my tribe with you. Is my right. family cool enough to be for us to be like you know a more you know cohesive tribe, a, a uniting a tribe? Yeah. One right? of one of the only times I ever stunned uh, Steve Harvey speechless in uh, I think the clips on YouTube probably where. I was on his show and we used to do questions, he and I, on the, on the segment. It was called How to Stay Married with James Sexton. And um, one yeah. of the questions was this, this young couple that was going to get married. And surprisingly, the girl wanted a really small wedding. Like she wanted just a lope and have nobody there. And the guy wanted to have like a whole thing. And I went first. Yeah. And I usually went first because Steve liked to hear what I said. And then he'd riff off of that. And most of the time he disagreed yeah. with me. And um, because we come from very different backgrounds. Oh, yeah. you should and, go on and, Dr. You should go on Dr. Phil sometime. Yeah. And I said <laughs> along the lines of like, look, you know, I I would have said in the past that weddings don't matter, you know, um, but like my mom died of cancer seven years ago and uh, after a long battle with cancer. And, and I have to tell you, like, I have some photos from my wedding, which was a long, long time ago before I, way before I got divorced. 
And those are some of the best pictures of my mom. Like the, she had her hair mm -hmm. where the cancer took it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to tell you, man, like I got stupid, wonderful memories of her dancing at that wedding and smiling. And, you know, I don't know, man, I, I still am so glad that like I had that wedding because it was just mm -hmm. like, I don't think a wedding is just about the two people. I think that the, I don't think the first time that you should get everybody you love in the same room is your fucking funeral. Like, I, I think that there are there are times to celebrate the, the tribes, the people in our lives who brought us where we are, the people who are going to support us as we move forward in our journey. And I think a wedding at its best is a celebration of that. It's mm -hmm. a celebration of that's why I still like weddings. Like, you know, people mm -hmm. don't want to invite a divorce lawyer to the wedding sometimes. But I, I, I uh, <laughs> actually have a friend I'm officiating his wedding in a couple of months. Oh, boy. Uh, which is crazy. Um, but, but, you know, I, I really do think that like a wedding can be an opportunity to just celebrate the bringing of people together and, and sort mm -hmm. of celebrating that, Hey, look, we're going to try to support these two young people as they move forward in this very challenging pair bond. And we're going to try to support them individually and collectively. And I think that's a very positive thing. So I think a wedding is a worthy thing to do. I, I think if you're going to be insane enough to get married and you're going to do this thing. I think you should do it in a way that, you know, brings people into the mix and, and has people participate and assist. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were asked on Soft White Underbelly if you still believed in marriage or you believe, no, you, you believe in love. Yeah. And, uh, and I was, I thought your answer was really good, but uh, maybe we'll save that for when you come out to Vegas. But I, uh, I wanted to just uh, point out the fact that like when I am critical of divorce or I'm critical of marriage. And when you're like this conversation we're having right now, I will guarantee you there'll be like half a dozen people who making a bunch of clips off of this shit. Oh, yeah. gonna go, Rolo hates marriage. Rolo can't, how, he's a hypocrite. How can he say these things? And, and because a lot of the, the, like you're saying, the conversation that you're having with, with me right now and probably with other people as well, it's difficult for them to hear because it sounds like you don't believe in love. It sounds like sure. you don't believe in the, sure. the more ephemeral side sure. of all of this. And sure. I was just saying, you know, like, you know, a, a marriage is not just between two people. It's between tribes as well. But uh, those are things that need to be discussed. But it's also, you know, there's this want, there's this want for it to work. You know, there's well, I, I have to say to be, a hundred percent, but you're mm -hmm. listen. one of the things about your work that I think is frustrating as, as a fan of your work for a long mm -hmm. time, is when I hear people oversimplify your perspective, because look, man, you, you know, if somebody says to me, so summarize the rational male. Well, OK, you know, summarize war and peace. Or it's about Russia, you know, mm -hmm. like summarize um, animal farm. It's about a bunch of animals on a farm. Like, no, it's about a lot more than that. Read the fucking thing. It's mm -hmm. nuanced. It's a multivariate equation. Like, yeah, you can clip you can clip pieces of this and throw them up on TikTok, or you can do like I, I can't tell you how many stupid, stupid TikToks people have sent to me of like people criticizing mm. the stuff I said on Steve Harvey. And they're like, look at this man saying that this woman shouldn't do this. And it's all like woke stupidity. And, and you know, look, the truth is like, you don't know my perspective. Like you're taking one clip from one piece without any context, without any nuance. There's a reason why we've been talking for three hours, hours and we yeah. really haven't covered with great depth a lot of these topics because I'm sorry, folks, you can't in 30 seconds synopsize like the only rational answer. I love these like when the presidential mm. debates happen and they're like, how should we deal with Israel and Palestine? You have 30 seconds. The only <laughs> rational thing you could say is, OK, that <laughs> fucking question can't be answered in 30 seconds. Yeah. It can't be answered in 30 minutes. It's a complex mm. problem that requires a complex answer. And it's asinine to suggest that you could synopsize that answer to 30 seconds. So I wrote that book. And when I did press on that book and I was on Rachel Ray and The View and all the things, everyone was like, what are three things people can do to stay married? And I'm like, listen, I wrote a fucking book. Read the book. Like if you mm. want a BuzzFeed list, of like quippy little things you could do. Go mm. buy a roomy book. Go buy like a little aphorism. <laughs> so buy like a calendar and go get a read about. <laughs> yeah, go buy some dumb little aphorism thing. Like, mm. like I said, I don't. I know how to spit it. You think I can't sit here and say like, well, we don't know who discovered but the water, but it wasn't a fish. And you know, like mm. a, an opposite problem is a like. There's so like many pithy quotes, that's but that's not helpful. Like so, yes, yeah, synopsize all you want. And, and like and dislike all you want. But at the end of the day, either, it, you know, if you don't have the attention span 
to have a thoughtful, nuanced conversation about mm -hmm. the pros and cons of things like this, you definitely don't have the attention span to get married, folks. You right. definitely don't it. have the attention span to get married. We'll end on this. Uh, so we just took advice from a guy that couldn't make marriage work. Uh, yes, no, you yes, just... yes, Zexy Texan. That's right, exactly right. correct. Yeah. That, that, that I, I got divorced. So therefore, I couldn't possibly, as a divorce lawyer with 23 mm. years of experience who's watched thousands of people navigate the divorce system, I couldn't possibly give you mm. advice on that. And I, here's what I'll bet, Zesta Texan, are you married? So you're an expert in marriage because mm. you're still married to your husband who's probably out banging somebody else right now or did a consult <laughs> with me last week. Like, you're right. You probably are hashtag blessed. Well, what you, and what I don't you, know what I'm talking about. Zesty Tech, well, whatever, Zesty Tech. What you've just heard for the last three hours is a guy who has been in a successful, happy marriage for about 20, for 27 year plus 27 years right now, whose daughter just got married at the beginning of this month. And it was a conversation between a guy who has been a divorce attorney for 23 years. You've heard a meeting of the minds. That's right. what you've heard. And by the you way, <laughs> you've also heard, I don't consider my marriage unsuccessful. I have an excellent ex-wife who's a dear friend. I have two amazing sons who are a combination mm -hmm. of me and that person. I have never for one second regretted that marriage. I'm so glad I married that person. I think she'd say the same thing about me. By the way, she's incredibly happily married to a wonderful guy who's actually a better pair for her than me, who's also a really wonderful, positive presence in my children's lives. I'm in a very happy, satisfied, long-term relationship with an amazing woman who's a much better pair for me. And we all sat together at my son's graduation and have had like this wonderful familial bond. So if that's failure, I'll take my failure over yep. the shitty marriages that I see people. I'll take it over the guy who has to pay for $50 hand jobs while he's making hundreds <laughs> of thousands of dollars a year married to a woman who hates him. I'll yeah. take my failure over that anytime. I was going to say is, I, again, it's, it, it's my great frustration that people expect like the pithy quotes or they expect the elevator yeah. pitch of the red pill. There is not. That's why we call this a pod class, not a podcast. So uh, thanks, man. Thank you for joining me oh, today. This is, uh, I know we've been going for, you stuck it out for three hours like a hero. Um, I, I, we're, definitely, we're definitely getting you out to Vegas. Uh, next show, yeah, of course, is uh, September 7th. Uh, maybe it's around then. We'll, we'll work it out because I'd really like to have a one-on-one -on -one with you and Sticky Paws. Maybe we'll bring Mike in uh, and we'll have, have this conversation. But I mean, good, have a good conversation with Lex Friedman. I know you're doing that one Thank next. you. Yeah, next week, heading to Austin. Yep. But uh, yeah, I mean, more you know more power to you i'm i'm glad Thanks, i'm glad to have had this chance i'm glad we're finally communicating awesome. Maybe I, feel, I feel like we can do something together in the future absolutely too, so. yeah. absolutely listen so, man big fan mm. of your work really appreciate having him so glad this happened it's a bucket list mm. thing for me so really all appreciate right. it brother thank you all thank right you. all right gentlemen uh thank you very much uh this has been a great conversation uh yeah, james freaking sexton man awesome man Good thank you for you coming and Thanks, uh, i will see you next in vegas and i'll see That's you guys cool. uh next week same time bye guys thanks yeah. a lot